Hey everybody, what's going on? Rob Cistrino back here on a night we're all about to get 10, maybe 20 times smarter as we are back here to ask questions here with our favorite roboticist. Here he is. It's Dr. Christian Hubicki. Christian, great how are to you? be here. Great. I'm doing great. Great to be back. It's, 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 so, so I got to get all those questions in, got to read some fun ones, and mostly mm -hmm. get to talk to you, Rob. What more can yeah. I need? Yeah. Uh, well, it was so much fun. We got to see you and Emily back in December. Uh, what a year right. 2023 was. I got to see you in person on not one, but two different occasions. That's right. That was that, that was great. We 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 hung out back in March of 2023. Mm -hmm. I was at your place, uh, and that, I got to hang out with you. And, and Jesse went and visited. That was a that was a great time. Yep, yep. And now here we are to talk about some science, some pop culture, maybe a little Survivor here uh, at the end of January. Yeah, I, I think this is this is great because like I feel like you have these off seasons between survivor seasons and things like that, that it's just, it's a good time to maybe take inventory of what's going on in the world, questions that people have. And so, so it's a good time. I mean, I mean, last year was a, was a real fun year, Rob, a lot of stuff going on, I have to say. And I was, I was very pleased about that. Okay. Well, Christian, very happy to have you back here to do this. Uh, appreciate you taking some time out of your very busy schedule to answer some listener submitted questions about a variety of topics, which we will get to here in just a little bit. What's new in your world? Oh, well, uh, so it's first time seeing you in the new year. So it's sort of, I realized I, I, I the work like to kind of go slide by without, if you don't sort of step back and be like, what has happened recently? And, you know, we had the fun New Orleans trip. It's so rare I get to come out and mm -hmm. like see you in person in like yep. in your in your your prime out amongst the podcast. In that prime, places, sure. Yeah. Your your natural habitat, if you will. And and see all the other survivors. So that was a lot of fun. I mean, and also a cool thing that I that got to do last year. I actually went to uh Dragon Con, Rob. I'm not sure you know you know what Dragon Con you heard of this? I don't. No. It's like it's like Comic Con, but it's like in the, the Comic Con like kind of the southeast. It's a lot more. It's a lot. It's a lot more sort of intimate. It's still big, uh, but it's basically a pop culture convention. And um, and I lived in Atlanta for years, and we would see all the people in their cosplay running around. We Emily and I would always go watch them, and we we're like, "Hey, let's actually go." We actually went up. It's about a four hour drive. Mm -hmm. and we went up there, and I actually I got booked to give robotics talks there. There's a whole robotics uh, track. At, yeah. At, 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 uh, so at Dragon Con. Uh, and Davey came to my robotics talks, mm -hmm. which, or at least one, was one of my robotics talks, which was which which was fun. And I got to got to be on one of my uh, so my, my favorite science podcast, my favorite pure science podcast. Uh, I think Whoa. a fellow a fe fellow uh, podcast award winning show like yours, Rob. Yes. Uh, and so I I've li and I'm listening to them since like 2005, and so it was a cool thing. I got to be on there and chat science with them. So it's a good time. Yeah. Oh, well, that's cool. Was Davey in costume? Oh, absolutely. I don't think he's ever not in costume, Rob. So it's a bit. Uh, yes. What yeah. costume was he in? It was OK. I, I, I'm just going to say it was an anime thing. That was yeah. the extent of my knowledge on the subject. Okay. I'll my, ask my, my knowledge. Of an, yeah. You ask him. My knowledge of anime is about two decades old. OK. All right. So we're going to get into a bunch of different stuff here with Christian. Anything you want to say to, uh, before we jump into the questions? No, other than I'm just let's just, why don't we just dive right in? OK. All right. So. Let's start here. And uh, Christian, we got uh, a question for you that is from Kat. Kat says, Dr. Hubicki, you often spot and call out fake slash doctored videos that appear to show robots doing incredible or very human-like actions. Why do you think these are so ubiquitous? Uh, I believe the term is ubiquitous, by the way. Yeah. Just, uh, correct that. Yeah. Okay. I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. I'm, I'm, I should leave the podcast right now. I'm toast. But no, it's a good question. We were just talking before we came on here, Rob. There's like, there were like fake Taylor Swift videos out. Not that she's a robot or anything. Yeah. I'll tell you a lot of, you know, doctored photos. Yeah. It's so many fake, uh, it, it, it's a renaissance for fake videos and photos these days. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll tell you, I hate it. I hate it so much. And uh, I don't think and, anybody and likes it. No, no one likes it. But it, it, I tell you, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll be more specific. You know, it's it's, it's like a, you know who loves a root canal. No, no one loves root canal, but I imagine there's some people who especially despise it. Dentists, yeah. that's true. Bill it. 
as do insurance companies. So they enjoy root canals, I guess. But when it comes to these robot videos, it's something that just hits me in my profession. Because yeah. Because it is so easy these days to make a fake robot video. And they just go viral. They show up on all of the social media platforms. And thankfully, people for helpfully forward them to me and ask, like, hey, this real? This real? Yeah. And and the answer is almost certainly no. Uh, there, there are, but it can be, but I understand it's the thing I hate about it is it really misleads people about what robots can do. Cause people have seen amazing robots like Boston Dynamics is robots that are humanoids that are doing backflips and, and, uh, and all this stuff. And so that looks incredible. And people come up to me and ask me if that's fake. I'm like, no, no, that's absolutely real. I, I know the people who work on that, you know, at least I know some of them and it's a real project. But what people are doing more recently is just. Would you ever get a Boston Dynamics dog? Oh, uh, play with Fermi. The lab. I mean, like, yeah, they they have actually a lot of competitors now. There are many uh, um, companies that sell these things. Uh, they all have different capabilities, different needs for researchers. Um, the I actually know a lot know a lot of researchers who have these. Um, so they're 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 helpful for trying out algorithms and stuff. But that's for research, right? And yeah. around the house. Around the house, I don't think they're that, that – that's a different story. I mean, <laughs> what do I use them for? Uh, it would be a gimmick around mm -hmm. my house. You know, uh, hand me a cup of coffee, please, because they, they can put an arm on top of the, the dog. So oh. That, yeah, that's a, there are many models of it. So, But when it comes to these robots, what they're typically these videos are, are just videos of people doing things that they, they just overlay a robot doing the same thing. And it's easier to do than ever. With uh, with some of with some of the uh, existing video editing software out, out there, that's now sort of neural network right. enabled, and yeah. so easier. And so people will just and, and and these things go viral, and it really annoys me. So and it can be and it's not there's not one really great fast and loose rule to say this is real, this is fake. It really draw I really have to draw upon the fact that this is my actual field of research and be like, no, that doesn't move how robots move. You know, it, it, you can, I mean, there are some uh, uh, tricks to sort of spotting it. Like if it really, uh, one is you look at the shadows, like some of these people are just so lazy of making these fakes. They didn't even bother changing the shadows. The shadows are the same as the person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can tell. Um, there are also other good tells that like, there's, there's one I saw of a soccer player, a robot soccer player, quote unquote, that was dribbling and doing crazy kick flips of the ball right around other soccer players. And my first red flag was, if this was a real robot, this would be a horrible liability. Because if that robot actually hurt, uh, bumped into the person, they would be horribly injured, if not killed. Mm -hmm. they, 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 if it's doing these crazy things, we would never let people close to the robots while they're doing anything like that. So it's like, that's enough. Like there's sort of like, it's a, there's soft red flags. Like ah, that would be a safety thing um, yeah. that back that, that can be helpful. But to the question, why are they so ubiquitous? It's because they, people want attention. It's that simple. It's cheap, easy clicks. And, um, and I, and, it, it, and what I, what it, and that nothing bothers me more than when people are either misleading or lazy, right? Uh, cutting corners to get attention, and they mislead people as a result. Like smart, and, and it just and if you fall for these, you're not a dumb person. You're not, but you're also, you know, you're, you're also not a roboticist. And I'll tell you, there are times where it's close to the border enough that I'm not sure. Normally, it's not like when it's so amazing. Normally, it's like when it's like so ridiculous like i saw a two-story tall robot once i was like who okay. on earth would build such a thing this thing would have cost tens of millions of dollars and this video was going around in like 2016 2017 and like i don't think this is real the video looked too shiny and turns out it was real it was a real thing oh. uh, it was real uh, a company in south korea uh, spent tens of millions of dollars to build a prototype of this humanoid robot that was like a Gundam, like a mech. And, and, and they had a video of it walking around. And I was like, wow, yeah, it is real. And I, I was, I, I, I played myself because I tried to play, uh, I'm not an expert in slotting fake videos. I should have stuck to what I was an expert in, which was robotics. And I should have been like, yeah, that was a reasonable thing. It was just been very expensive. I don't, I haven't seen it since that robot, but it was real. Mm -hmm. So 
it's a real problem trying to figure out these things are real or not. But if you find one and you're not sure, just hit me up on some social pl- app and I'll and hopefully I'll get to it. And then Christian, with these fake robot videos, then when you make a real robot video, uh, then are people like, oh, this isn't even that cool because I just saw one that can go and play soccer against a bunch of people and shoot it in goal. Yeah, that's that's very much a problem. That's more of a personal annoyance to mm-hmm. me because my students work really hard on this stuff and you put it out there and it's it's, it's eclipsed by something that's actually fake. Um, but so yeah, that that is an annoyance to, I, and I think that it just, it bothers me that when people, it just misleads people as to what robots are even capable of. And, it, and that can unnecessarily scare people. Even when silly stuff, like years ago, there was a guy who made a CGI video, which wasn't even intended to be a hoax. It was just an art project of a robot bowler. And it was a bowling robot that was just an industrial arm-like robot you would see in a factory. And yeah. it does this crazy flipping maneuver and throws the ball down the alley and gets a strike in this crazy way. And I commented on this and I was like, look, this guy, and he, and he got passed around as real. He never intended it for to be real, but people latched on to it, reposted it without effort, with, with without any credit as to what it was. And people were like, this is scary. This is crazy what robots can do this, uh, uh, what robots can do these days. And I was mm-hmm. so miffed that I actually did the math for what, for what one of these robots could actually do. I looked up all the plans, all the specs. I did a physical simulation of how the robot would try to throw a ball. And basically, it would have tossed it like three inches. And then it would have rolled slowly down the lane. I even created a little animation showing what it would actually do. And so I just wanted to make sure people knew this is what robots are actually capable of. And so there's, you don't get scared unnecessarily. Yeah. So. We're not ready to turn over bowling to the robots. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, certainly not in that way, for sure. No. Okay. Uh, even the worst robot bowler are probably better than me, though. I am. <laughs> I, I am a horrible bowler. Okay. All right. Let's. Uh, why don't we stick with uh, this and uh, talk about some of these robots? Ali yeah. wants to know what do you think of Tesla's humanoid robot Optimus? Oh, the robot Optimus out of Tesla. It's making all the waves these days. It's a good robot. It's well made. It's a real made by real uh, researchers. And I, I, have a, I know I have a little knowledge of this. This is actually my specific subspecialty is humanoid robots. Mm-hmm. And I gave a whole talk about it actually at Dragon Con of all things, because those people love hearing about uh, uh, robots like in movies and the whole history of them. And right now, humanoid robots are a big in, are, are a big and growing industry. There is like a ton of startups. It's not just Tesla. There are not even just companies that like I have known from years ago like five or so years ago, there are companies popping up almost every week with Mm -hmm. uh, claiming that they're going to have a new humanoid robot. Some of them have actually already built one. Some of them actually have built several. When I was making this talk um, for Dragon Con, I was, I was going through making sure I counted all the companies that had, that were claiming to build or hoping to sell humanoid robots. And I had to update it because that very day, uh, another, another uh, startup had announced they had launched. It's crazy. Um, Mm -hmm. and so Tesla is not the only one. There have been companies that come in before and after, and they're all kind of seeking different parts of the market. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to put robots in factories that can actually walk around. That's the current goal of the industry. They want to be like Amazon has invested. Uh, so I, I have some, I have some ties to some of these companies, uh, not any financial ties, sadly, that would have been nice, but like my former professor, uh, my, my research advisor, like the guy who like taught me a lot of robotics, he started a company. He told me when, when I first work, started working with him, it's like, Christian, I'm going to start a company. I'm not going to stay a professor for that long. I'm, it's going to be called Agility Robotics, and I'm going to start it up. I'm like, okay, that's good. As long as I graduate before you're out as a professor, that's cool. And he just got like a $100 million investment from Jeff Bezos for his mm-hmm. company. So he's doing okay. I went into the lucrative field of teaching, Rob. Yeah, that's what that's I, I that's that's where I went. Um, but I worked on the research that uh, that became that company. So um, as part of my PhD, and he their company is trying to get uh, robots in Amazon warehouses to pick up totes, little boxes full of stuff, and move them from place to place, and get up high and pick them up and walk sure. around. And that's a pretty good target because one of the big problems with humanoid robots is they're not all that reliable yet. You would not want one in your house because it could fall on you. It could fall on grandpa. 
uh, not a good thing. But in a factory, it's a little bit more well controlled. That's what they're trying to do. That's what Elon Musk is also trying to do with the Tesla Optimus. He's claiming this is going to be a relatively low cost uh, humanoid. It's going to work at Twitter, uh, right? For, for how long is the question? <laughs> how long is anyone going to work at Twitter? That's the but that's a different story. I'm yeah. not a business analyst, so mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. But that's so so he wants so he's claiming his niche that he's trying to carve out is that these are going to be low cost humanoids. And just what what low cost means is that like I can buy a humanoid from a company like my professors for you know somewhere in the range of the low hundreds of thousands, like one to okay. two hundred thousand dollars. Uh he wants to push it down the Elon Musk wants to push it down to like twenty thousand. It okay. is okay. Theoretically possible with economies of scale, I I won't believe it until I can buy one. Uh, and so mm -hmm. anyway, so he's in this space. Tons of other companies. So maybe are in if this you space. were to like mass produce like an entire army of these humanoid robots, that would be the optimal way to roll these out. Yeah, and I wouldn't use the word. I'm careful about using the word army when it comes to robots. That's just a, a reflex of mine from <laughs> knowledge in the field. But yeah, but yeah. let's say a fleet, a fleet, a, yeah. a, a cohort, a, uh, and of these robots. I'm not sure what the uh, what what the what the plural form of robots is. Like you know, like a like a flamboyance of flamingos. Flock. Yeah, a fl uh, yeah, or, or a parliament of owls, or maybe something like that for humanoid robots. But. The robots, so back to Elon Musk's Tesla's robot, it's a well-made robot, but I, I think that where it is best amongst all the cohorts is that actually it's got pretty good dexterity in the hands. Its hands are pretty dexterous. I'm more of a, I'm a leg specialist, so I comment more on the legs. Um, so like from a walking standpoint, it's walking is okay. I was, I was quoted uh, in all places in the LA Times, Rob, by my opinion on this robot. Um, I put out a massive long tweet thread, which I'm sure you're shocked I would do such a mm -hmm. thing, about my engineering opinions of the robot when it was unveiled. And it, it's 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 well engineered. It's fine. Uh, it's it's walking is is okay. Like I mean, I would say it's good for something that would have been made like maybe you know five ten years ago. But they're catching up. They're basically made this robot in almost no time flat, like a year and a half. That's really fast. So, but like, I was like, yeah, the, the walking is not mind blowing, is what I said. And the LA Times quoted me as saying, not mind-blowing, says Christian Hubicki. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. great. And my, my, my mom said, uh, Elon's not going to like you. I was like, ah, you know, que sera, such is <laughs> life. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, it's- Not it's, his it's favorite funny. member of your cast, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, and so I would say, look, it's it's got potential. And most recently, what we're starting to see robots seem to do better at, it's not- the walking. The walking is kind of good enough on a lot of these robots to walk around in a factory. They're not having to go hike out in the woods where where twigs can snap and logs can roll and moss can slip. All that stuff. You're in a factory, so it's not so bad. But the hand dexterity and the tasks that pe that these robots can do appears to be getting better. Um, you'll they'll have they'll have videos of it appearing to fold laundry, for instance. Oh, but this is where I want to give a word of caution to your audience members. Is that a deep fake? Okay? It's not a deep fake. It is a real video, but there are lots of caveats that you have to ask yourself when you see these videos because it can is because sometimes these are videos where it's not the robot deciding how to do this. There is it's being teleoperated by a person. There's yeah. a person with basically hand joysticks moving it around and doing the task mm -hmm. now. There's value in that. It shows that the robot is physically very dexterous and capable. That's a thing. But it can lead people to believe that the robot is automatically doing these things, which is also especially tricky because some of these robots can start to do these things automatically. I have colleagues who work on laundry folding robots, and they have uh, special AI algorithms for laundry folding. And the way they work is there's something called behavior cloning, where they'll, what they will do is they'll make the robot do the task by teleoperation by hand with these little joysticks. And then they will give a bunch of examples of that to an algorithm. And then it will try to do a bunch of pattern recognition, something called stable diffusion that will try to re recreate that motion. And sometimes it does a pretty dang good job of making the robot do that thing again, even if the cloth is in a little bit of different place. So that stuff's real. So you have this weird wash of stuff that, is kind of real, kind of not, rather real, but kind of not, or very real. 
And um, and so what you so people need to be better who are putting out these videos of explaining what is going on behind the scenes. Is this being teleoperated? Another thing, sometimes people will speed up the videos to make it look like it's doing it faster, but you don't really know if that's the case. So it can make mm-hmm. it look more impressive. Like Tesla got a lot of people claiming one of their videos was fake. Well, I think what it was, it was just sped up, but it didn't say it was sped up. So it looked a little fake. Um, so it's, so it's, it's, it's a robot that's promising, but there's a lot of competition in the field. There are a lot of people who have been building humanoid robots for, for a decade or two now who are now started companies. So we will see how many of these companies survive. Will we actually get humanoid robots in a practical application? That is the biggest question of my field. Will that actually be useful and cost effective? And we just don't know. We just don't know. They are clearly betting that they will. I Thankfully, I don't have a dog in that fight because I can. Uh, I, I work in, in in academic research, so. Yeah, but it's it's that big of a question. If it will happen, it feels like that we're very close, right? It always feels close, Rob. I think, it, in my opinion, like it, that's it looks so tantalizingly close. But you know, back in two thousand and six, uh, self driving cars looked tantalizingly close. They mm-hmm. had just won a major, there was a major competition in 2006 called the DARPA Urban Challenge for making self-driving cars. And it looked, and and uh, this, and I, forget, I forget the exact years, I apologize. In the 2006, 2007 range, uh, they made autonomous vehicles that would drive around in a simulated city, obey traffic laws, and all these things. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was over 15 years ago. And yes, there are these things on the road, but their adoption is not massive. Like if people, if you, uh, at the time it seemed, oh my goodness, we are so close. And as a result of that competition, Google and Ford and whoever, tons of companies just bought up all of the people who worked on these competitions and said, we're starting autonomous cars division. We got a race to be the first. I don't think any of those companies thought they'd still be in this place that they are 15 years later because some nuts are tough to crack, even if it looks like they're close. Okay. Christian, let's take a question from Karen who wants to know, what is your take on the traders? Follow-up question from Sarah. Uh, if you could pick one other person from reality TV to play the game with, uh, who would it be? That's a great question. I, I have seen season one of the traders. I still need to catch up on what is currently airing, which is season two. Uh, right. That, that's a okay, season. So one we don't have to fun. worry about you spoiling anybody. No, I'm not going to spoil anything from season two. Um, so, but like the, but season one was fun. I, I was glad that it got re-aired on Bravo at some point and we happened to have recorded it and we were like, Hey, let's watch it. And it, 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 it was fun. A little bit, a little bit on the cheesy side, but you know, that's Alan mm-hmm. coming. He's got to lean into the role you know, of the, uh, of Trader. Um, I think it's a fun show. I'm glad to see a popular version of Mafia or Werewolf that people can get into. And mm-hmm. the idea that they are now moving from half reality TV people to full reality TV people, I think is the right move. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think definitely the right move. Um, I, I the, my, my critique of the game is whether the challenges matter. And, and I thought that was one of the things that like from, I, hopefully they fix a bit from season one, that season, season one, like you're supposed to win money from this challenge that goes into the pot, kind of like the bowl where your money is in a pot. Right. But, but no one is sabotaging the pot to like, you know, there's no mole sabotaging pot. So people are just trying to win the challenge and they won most of them. And then, in the, then I guess minor, minor spoilers. In the end, it didn't even matter because they just gave them a challenge to win all the rest of the money that they didn't win in the first place. So I'm like, what yeah. is the point of this? So the setting was cool. They, they got to fill out Scottish- the hour. That's the point. They, they do. But like, I, I they just got to have more game mechanics embedded in the challenge um, mm-hmm. is what they would need. Like, And there needs to be more ways that these players, these, you know, for those who don't know, the traders and the, uh, the there are two groups there are the traders and the faithful. And these poor faithful are just murdered at night by these traders with very little, very, it's, you, you can influence the traders if you're really clever, but you also got to get lucky. And so I feel there needs to be a little bit more agency on the behalf of the faithful to be able to save themselves uh, in a more active way, at mm-hmm. least for a little bit. That, that's, that was my take. I was like, man, it would stink to be a faithful unless you got lucky. Yeah. Being a trader is where all the fun is. Do you have a, um, something that you could put into the game to implement to try to help out the faithful? I think that there would need to be the, I, I would, 
maybe take a little bit of a page from the mole where like if you wanted to save like maybe there's a way to like not help in the challenge like in the, the, the in, in the mole there was the op opp opportunity to win exemptions if you did something in the challenge that maybe was not helpful to the to the to the team and so it was a trade off you know that that so you could and the exemption would save you from this next round of elimination there was there's something like that that happened in season one. You might remember a little better than me, Rob, what was going on with like because mm -hmm. people would have the ability to win kind of immunity, but it was the like shield. A, it was like it was a shield, right? It was like a basically a rock draw though. It was random draw as to whether you actually got it, even if you completed the task. So I, I think that there needs to be something that's a little bit more connected to the agency of the player that they did this thing, therefore they earn safety, but at what cost? Mm -hmm. And um so I think there, there was not enough tension in how the challenges were thrown into there. I understand that it's it's a show. They have to have people running around and doing things. There has to be some kind of action. Some of the actual challenges themselves were kind of interesting, uh, but mm -hmm. it needs to be better connected to the format of the show. Yeah. One of the ideas I really like is that in the missions, if completed, the faithful get a clue as to the identity of one of the traders so that the traders are incentivized oh. to kind of tank the missions a little bit more. That's good. That does, that's not in season two, is it? No. That's not in season. No. no it's not, that that would be interesting. I mean, that would be tough to balance for the uh, for for the for the production of the show to get to to get a clue. Maybe you know what what it could be. Uh, like you get the opportunity to investigate maybe one player if you like if you mm -hmm. in a rare instant in, in, instance like that because those, those are, are mechanics. Go on. Yeah. Like um, that a you get to, will tell you how many traders there are, like uh, how many traders are women, you know, like it could be some kind of like vague piece of information that could be valuable. Yeah. A little like guess who, you know? Yeah. Does, does your trader have a beard? No, your history. Mm -hmm. So the uh, I think that and, and the nice thing is that you could give it to the players like individually in private so they could potentially lie. And the traders could try to win it themselves and yeah. lie some more. Well, claim to fame and, uh, in terms of like going to the wine cellar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was like, well, that, that so the, like the show claim to fame is that what you're talking I was going to yeah. bring that up as an example. Even yeah. I know about a little bit about claim to fame. Like, and I think that was always like, like the, uh, wasn't that the danger is that like, uh, one of the clues was too on the nose, and then other than that famous first boot of that episode of that season was someone was Tom Hanks's, uh, niece. like, yeah, loved one or something, niece. Yeah. And there was some, and the clue was, could you guess the premise of the show is, can you guess who this person's claim to fame is? What famous person are they are they known to be close to? And the clue was something about a park bench. Yeah, I'm not and, sure if that was in the clue wall or if they ended up pulling it from the wine cellar. But there, yeah, basically, like there was a green. I think it was on the memory wall, the the clue wall. There was like a green park bench. Yeah, I I, I think that the idea of even knowing how many the number of traders left would be a helpful thing, especially at certain points of the game, not too close to the end, because then you that that would be giving away way too much. But yeah, I think that they need more clue, abilities for the faithful to deduce what's going on. Okay. Um, if you could pick one person from reality TV to play oh. the game with, who would it be? Honestly, I'd be cool with any of the housewives. I love the fact I mean, there's something that I, I, there is something so intoxicating to me that I would love to be at the bar with the housewives. I would just mix martinis for them. Like I would study yeah. how to mix good martinis and just, just hand them out and just, what, and, are you and a big Bravo old. guy? Uh, back in the day, I was. Uh, yeah, I used to be a big, a real house of Atlanta and Beverly Hills watcher, and a little bit of Vanderpump Rules mm -hmm. uh, for a long time. So that, that was, that's what I was mostly. That was my sphere. So when the fact that there was Phaedra and Sheree on this season that's coming up, I'm like, oh, oh my goodness! If I could have just been amongst these folks, I that would be a lifetime of stories that I could uh, that I that I could just take with me to my grave. And okay. uh, that, that's what I would like. All right. We got a question from Sam. I don't think this is Sam Moore, but the question is during casting for Survivor, did you feel pressure to prove how smart you were to CBS? I did. Absolutely. <laughs> Specifically, like once, once you get into the casting process, you have at least some idea of what they're looking for in you. You mm -hmm. know, I, I like, I, I they, they didn't, you know, cast me because I'm going to roast people like Courtney Yates 
mm-hmm. you know like, like, they, like if, if they, they didn't they didn't they didn't cast me for that they cast me maybe to be witty but definitely you know i'm the robot guy if i show up and i take that iq test that jeff keeps talking about at the old reunions and i and i beef it i'm like i'm toast yeah so i was so nervous yeah, they never announced stuff. anybody's iq anymore what's up with that yeah, they don't. And I thankfully I'm I'm glad. I I I've never taken an IQ test in my life uh, until until that moment. Mm-hmm. And I still they never told me my score. Um I remember I bumped into one of the producers during casting. I was like, so so are you gonna tell us your, our results? And it's like, oh, you did fine. I'm like, I'd like to know my results, please. So there is that and also in any in, in any interview, you know, I knew that anything I have to say, I had to somehow tie back to being quote smart somehow right and it's helpful to have some kind of like just feet some superhuman-esque feet uh that sh- demonstrates that and I'll, I'll use other people's examples of this like i know dwight dwight from 43 season 43 like one of his things was that he aced the acts he got a perfect mm-hmm. score on the acts and that franny got a perfect score on the mcats right and so if you're the quote the smart person you know you have to, nice to have one of those those feats that you throw out there so i have my feet about the graduate gre math or whatever and and the and, but, so i like I, I i you have to like brag about this stuff and it's very uncomfortable so it's actually a bit of a skill to have to figure out how to brag about things without seeing full of yourself and so that was tough but yeah. i was so nervous yeah go on how did you do it how did i how did i do it the, yeah oh, how did how did you go about bragging about yourself? Oh, I, I mean, just kind of almost like act. Half, I mean, like be I guess actually half embarrassed that you have to say it. That's that's the sort of like it's like I I know you need to know this thing. It's like it's like you know I'm, I'm a smart guy. You know I I aced my GRE math. You know I I I took the you know eight hour uh, fundamentals of engineering exam in four hours because I had other things to do. That's but that's the way you mm-hmm. kind of just throw it out there. Like that's like good. Like that's you, double good. Cause not only can you do it, but it's also, you had things to do. Yeah, exactly. And so, and so, and so like, and I'm a little embarrassed saying it right now. So I hope that comes across in the podcast, but like, that's, you have to kind of throw these things out there and expect, I mean, now if your thing is you're, you're arrogant, then obviously you, mm-hmm. you go for that. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about it, but that I mean, but really the, the fact that the context matters, like you have, you're supposed to know these things about me. And if you don't mention them, They'll be like, oh, what are you stupid? Why didn't you just tell us about this? But uh, I, I was so nervous during that casting process. It was crazy. And I, that especially early on, like, the, I won't give away anything that CBS I don't think wouldn't like, but like, they know we go, they, they would fly us out to Los Angeles and we do these interviews. And I knew at some point I was going to meet at the time Lynn Spillman who was the casting the casting director. I knew I was going to meet her. And I knew that I was sitting in a hotel room by myself waiting for a phone call, waiting for a phone call. Uh, I missed two meals because I was waiting for this phone call. I didn't go eat. And eventually they thought I didn't care about the process because I wasn't bothering to go eat. I was like, no, 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 I'm not going to leave this phone. And they said, no, Christian, we will come get you if you're eating. You're not going to miss the call because you ate. And I'm like, oh. And so I was nervous uh, that I I didn't even eat. Mm -hmm. And so, and further, like there were times where like, I, I got to be by the pool and we got to be, uh, and I finally left the room to go to the pool because we were allowed to. And I accidentally packed the wrong swimsuit. And it was a swimsuit that I had from when I was 40 pounds heavier. I lost 40 pounds. Wow. I lost the swimsuit. I was like, and I put it on. I realized this is, I'm going to Macaulay Culkin myself. If I jump into the pool with this, I'm going to, I'm going to be sans swimsuit. And that's not a way to make an impression. So I'm like trying to cinch up my swimsuit so it doesn't, you know, mm-hmm. fall around my feet at some point. I'm trying to cinch it up and also go for a swim. Because I want to show I can swim. I, I'm a pretty decent swimmer because I'm in front of these other contestants who are also vying for the show. I want these people to know that I'm a, you know, I'm reasonably athletic. I can swim. And um, and, and a casting director comes up to me and they, and they, and they, they pull me aside and they start yelling at me. Like, Christian, what the hell are you doing? And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, I heard that you were doing a strip tease by the pool. <laughs> do you did you read on Reddit that this was a good idea to do this? Because this is gonna, you know, this is gonna get you off the show. It's like that's like blah blah. It's like that's like no no. I I explained the you know the uh, the bathing suit situation, and then they kind of laughed it off, and I went all about my way. Eventually, got cast on the show, and only later, once I'm actually on the show, did I realize 
how much of an impression this made that we were on here in Fiji, we were on these speedboats being introduced to the world uh, on these speedboats driving around in Fiji. And then the camera guy will come up and give you this pan up hero shot. He'll do this for all the different players, you know, for whatever hero shot they need. And I see that, you know, they go up to Pat from my season, who's got his knuckles, he's, it says self-made, tattooed on his knuckles. They pan in, see the camera guy pan in on his knuckles. They go up to Gabby, and and, and Gabby, that they must instruct her to like, you know, push up your glasses on your face, you know, to like show you're astute. And they come up to me and they say, Christian, tap your fingers like you're nervous. Yeah. Okay. I'm the nervous guy. My primary trait on this show was that I was nervous. Probably in no small part for all the shenanigans that they had to talk me out of doing during casting, but not, not the least of which was me being nervous about not seeing being smart enough. I was very nervous. I didn't do well on that. Okay. So, yeah, so in a way it does fit. Yeah, it does fit. Okay. Thank you for listening. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, before you go on to the next one, yes? Rob, I apologize. I forgot. I have an Elon Musk story. Oh, I meant to talk about this okay. when this robot thing came up. Um, so like I like I I my history is in like is in humanoid robots and so uh, I when I went to graduate school uh, I graduated with my I graduated with my PhD in 2015 and this was a very particular uh, fruitful era, uh, era for uh, humanoid robots uh, the the government put a ton of money into funding teams of researchers to build robots for what was called the DARPA Robotics Challenge and mm -hmm. the whole thing was inspired by. A uh, disaster that happened in Japan when that tidal wave hit Japan, and in 2011, and the, and the nuclear power plant was melting down. They couldn't get robots in to shut off the reactor. Robots weren't mobile enough; they couldn't get around like people. So the government funded this massive competition. It's like, hey, the team that 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 gets a that, that gets their that makes a robot that can go in to a simulated power plant and shut off the valve, you know, gets some huge prize and. And our team was funded through some other program. We weren't eligible for the prize, for the prize, but we showed up in 2015 at this major uh, final competition, and we were putting on a show. It was basically in Pomona. It was at a big raceway that they turned into a giant robotics competition. And we showed up with our robot. It was a legged robot. It only just walked around, but we wanted to show how well it walked. So we put on this show where we would walk it out in front of the audience. We would have it run. We would throw dodgeballs at it to see if it wouldn't fall. So it wouldn't fall yeah. over. We, we, we had a guy who was a, who was a robot kicker. He would kick the robot and show that it would catch itself. It was a you know, two-legged robot yeah. walking around called Atrius, A-T-R-I-A-S. I, I did the social media campaign for that robot. You can still find the videos on YouTube. And so we, and the, and I rem, and we had this robot set up to go. And we had sort of like a support structure that was there to catch it in case it fell down during the show and it wouldn't break and, you know, destroy my hopes and dreams. And uh, we were getting ready to go to the show and I had to go off and do a thing. And I came back to be ready for the show. And my teammates were like, Christian, you won't believe what just happened. Like, what? Elon Musk just walked over. He sat on our robot support rig and with his sons and with his children watched the competition and turned to them and said, I could build a better humanoid robot and then walked away. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. That's a story. And then, you know, seven years later, he actually built a humanoid robot. So that mm -hmm. was completely unsurprising to me when he went to that. So yeah. Okay. He sat on our robot support rig, which was not designed for sitting by the way. And I don't think he asked for permission either. So mm -hmm. all this seems to track. Yeah. So in a way that, is Elon was like really inspired by what you all were doing? It's possible. I mean, certainly I think he saw that from this and other things and from other things I've heard that he's done, he's, 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 he was aware of what's going on in the field. I think it's always in the back of his mind that he wanted to make a robot like this. That, that makes total sense. It totally tracks. And I think that this showed that it was within striking distance. I think that's when he starts to latch onto projects would be my guess. Like, Oh yeah, no, this is, I, I don't have to develop a bunch of novel science from scratch. Mm -hmm. This stuff is almost kind of ready there. Yes, I might have to do, you know, a lot of, that's not just him. A lot of startups do this. This is what all startups do. They say, they don't, they don't necessarily say, we have to develop a bunch of fundamental science before we could ever actually do a product. They say, you know what? The science is about at the right place right now that we, with a bit of a push and a bit of investment, they should take off. So yeah, I mean, certainly he was there. And, and noting the robots and clearly thought he had some ideas for how he could improve them. 
All right. Let's take a question from Jeff, who says, what is the chaos theory and how does it work? So, uh, so, so the chaos theory, the chaos theory. So chaos theory is a fun one. Um, popularized, I think, best by Jurassic Park by Jeff Goldblum. That's oh. uh, he was he is a mathematician and uh, yes. as, uh, as Ian Malcolm, and he even called him a, a chaotician is what he called himself. And mm -hmm. I was like, is that a is that a, a, a actual thing? I remember thinking, or is it like Taken, where Liam Neeson says he's a preventer? I believe his his job. Mm -hmm. I looked that up, and someone said that is not a job. Right. So is chaotician a job? I think it actually is a subfield of mathematics. So, so chaos theory, we people might know popular ideas like such as the butterfly effect, and that's actually uh, very true. The idea that chaotic systems, what they are, are what we call nonlinear systems. So we, if that a system has to be quote nonlinear in order to be chaotic. And I'll just give like my analogy for what um, for what a nonlinear system is. So. A linear system, in contrast, is a system where if you put something in, you get something out, and you put a little bit more in, you get a little bit more out. The example I give is sort of like driving. That, you know, you turn the wheel of your car a little bit, you'll, uh, you know, it'll turn a little bit. Turn the wheel a little bit more, it'll turn a little bit more. But let's take an extreme example of driving, such as from the movie Cars. Now, okay. I think you and I... Yeah, we we did you ever see the original cars? I think we were of that generation sure. to see that, yeah. right? I'm sure you remember the plot beat by beat. Yeah. These days when I bring up this analogy to my students, they weren't alive for the original cars. They're talking about like cars three or whatever. So mm -hmm. my analogy no longer holds. But in that movie, there was a scene where Lightning McQueen, the main character, had to drive towards some cliff and then turn really fast to make it to to to, to turn and then not fall off. And Lightning McQueen would had to turn left, so he jerked, you know, to the left really hard, and then he just tumbled off the cliff. And I forget how he doesn't perish from this whole scenario, but he somehow survives. And he says, "No, no, no, this is impossible. You gave me this task; this cannot be done." Then some old grizzled uh, former race car shows him how it's done. He drives up. Richard to the Dreyfus. Cliff. Uh, probably probably yeah. yeah the purple car richard yeah i think it was the purple like i don't know cars. the mayor um yeah yeah it's something like that it, was, it wasn't mater it was it was uh was not mater uh, like he's like uh, the mayor right the mayor yes the mayor yes he was the mayor sorry it's a yeah. mayor i that i know i remember the major mater not the, the mayor mm -hmm. and so the mayor instead of turning left really hard turns right really hard it's not really races. tall it's, sorry. it's uh paul newman not richard paul Trump. newman sorry what well, I'll, Sorry, everyone. You know, I'll, you'll, you'll never live this down, Rob. Yeah, you'll never okay. live down. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but 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 Paul Newman, it was it, decides to turn right really hard in order to go left. He drift races around the, around the corner. In fact, he went the entire opposite direction, but got the opposite result. Mm -hmm. That so basically, cars was, in my opinion, was exhibiting the idea of a nonlinear system. So, so we, we, we're, we, just because you put in a little bit more doesn't mean you get a little bit more. In fact, you can do something wildly different and get something crazy out. That's what a nonlinear system is. And that's what you need to have in order to have a chaotic system. So a chaotic system uh, is something where it has what it's called sensitive to initial conditions. A classic example is the weather. This mm -hmm. is where the butterfly effect comes from. That name is the idea that a small change to the initial conditions of the weather, this current condition that you're in, such as a tiny butterfly flapping its wings in, in, in Argentina will eventually cause a hurricane somewhere. Yeah. And that's, you know, yeah. I feel like that the butterfly effect, and I, and I just recently had like heard the right definition. I feel like that, and I don't know if yeah. I blame Ashton Kutcher, but I feel yeah. like I've heard an alternate um, explanation of the butterfly effect. What is that? What did you hear? Which is like, if you went back to, as uh, maybe Jeff Goldblum might know, uh, Jurassic Times, and stepped on a butterfly, it would have great ramifications through the course of history. And that's not necessarily true. That's not yeah. necessarily true. And, and so it's 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 kind of I get where they're going for because the idea is they're trying to say that hey, the the world is so chaotic that tiny changes to the initial conditions. So way back in dinosaur time, butterfly dies, we don't evolve as mm -hmm. people. That's what they're going for. But it kind of ignores that that's sort of like the pop idea of chaos theory, which is, oh, it just means things are crazy. And yes, things are crazy, 
But it also there's also structure to chaotic systems. It doesn't mean that literally anything happens in a chaotic system. It's just very difficult to predict exactly what will happen. Mm-hmm. There can be what we call strange attractors. And this is what I Jeff yeah. Goldblum just really nailed this performance because he talked about, I think he used it to to hit on Laura Dern. He's like, Oh, you must be familiar with the concept well, of attraction. Back up. Like, that's no. Sam Neill's lady. That's right. That's right. But you right. know, I gotta say, that's a an effective use of a met- of, of a mathematical metaphor. Yeah. Basically, but, there are states. Go on. No, uh, I, I listened to uh, an interesting podcast uh, on the, the plain English podcast that they were talking about this to describe uh, the Stanley uh, water bottle craze of that, you know, basically like all these systems are chaotic and that, you know, just because like one phenomenon happens uh, out of like just sheer luck. Yeah, I mean, and so there's a lot of little things in the world that are equally as probable or similarly probable, and then you juke one way in history, you juke another way in history, one could happen or the other. But that doesn't mean literally anything can happen. Uh, there are there are still structure to the world um, and and how and how things work. I mean, I mean, suddenly, I mean, water wouldn't you know freeze into gas. That's just physics, and there's still physics to what happens. But particularly, there are still states. Of, mm-hmm. uh, of the system of the world that can still be that you can still be attracted to that the world can still go towards that there's structure these are things called strange attractors and uh, this is sort of the very very high level concept of of this so it's not just that things are crazy it's just there's also structure to how things are crazy and how some things can now can, can still come back to similar results so it's i i feel like that there is good that there is good material for some popular piece of media or even a YouTube video for people highlighting uh, some of the more subtle aspects of chaos theory because everyone's heard of the butterfly effect uh, but I feel it, it's, it's more nuanced than that and the ways that things can kind of come back together in spite of all these changing initial conditions maybe just a slightly different way is also interesting okay all right let's uh, stick with building off of lightning McQueen okay Lightning yeah. McQueen used to go fast. Brando wants to know: Do thoughts have a speed limit? Yeah, I, this was this question. I, this came in early in, when we put up that questionnaire, and I actually put out a a reel. I, I tried putting out a reel on Instagram about this. I yeah. was intrigued by this question to get people's interpretations. I mean, the short answer is: So you answered yes. this question already on Instagram? No, I didn't answer it. I just like I thought it was it, there was lots of layers to the question what i thought and so that, that that like at first i thought i heard that question and oh that means what is the speed limit between something happening to me and me thinking about it and doing something about it at which point there's absolutely a speed limit to that and there's speed the answer to all these things are yes and it also could mean like what is the literal speed at which thoughts travel through your head mm-hmm. what is that speed and that's something we actually know too so I was asking people on Instagram, hey, what when you hear this question, how do you interpret it? What's the question you actually want to know the answer to? Mm-hmm. Turns out most people just wanted to know like the literal speed at which you react to things or the speed they travel through your head, which is which is true. But I got some creative versions of it as well. But you know, operating off the assumption that you know that thoughts are the results of neurons firing in your brain, um, there's a lot of things you can discern from that. Um, for instance, you know, if you if that if you wanted to actually map how long it is, how fast um signals travel through your brain, I've seen estimates somewhere on the order of 250 miles an hour. So like if you fire something okay. here, you get to your back of your head, 250 miles an hour, tiny fraction of a second. Doesn't right? have to go that um, far, right? Doesn't have to go that far, uh, but that doesn't mean that's the speed at which you think, but that's how fast signals can prop- propagate uh, through, through your head. So not as fast as an airplane, uh, but probably faster than your car, unless you got some kind of, I don't know, Bugatti thing. Unless you're know, Lightning McQueen. Speed. The yeah, Lightning McQueen, you know, who doesn't know how to turn around a racetrack. But there are other interpretations, such as what, ha- how long does it take for you to react to something in the world and then make a decision based on that? Mm-hmm. And it's about roughly half. Depends on the decision. Depends on the decision. Yeah, that's true. As fast. So, what's the speed limit on the decision? You mm-hmm. know, it's a, it's a, you know, like, for instance, if it's a long decision, such as me deciding what questions to ask on this podcast, which takes as an, un, until the podcast starts, that's a long decision. Fast decisions, roughly half a second. And this is actually a really interesting study I saw. I was, I was digging into this. And I feel this could take 
a much deeper dive. Absolutely, it's a whole field of neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience in particular, which is the science of thought, is, is huge. But there was an interesting study which tried to take advantage of this idea that it takes about a half a second to react to something. Mm -hmm. And you might say, but sometimes, you know, a half a second is not that long. It's, it's, it's not mm -hmm. that short. It's like, that's one Mississippi. It's about that. It's not too much. Sorry, it's 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 I say it's 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 fast, but it's not like I feel like I can perceive things faster than that. If you said something, I feel like I could react faster. Why does right. it seem like it's that long? Well, it turns out our bot our, our brains are doing a lot of tricking of our of ourselves. We're tricking ourselves a lot into thinking we're more in the in the moment than we are. And our brains give us the they try to construct this sort of complex sensation that we are in the present when we're in fact like a, a fraction of a second behind. And re researchers exploited this fact, and, and, I, and, I, and I tried to really get my head around this study. And what they did was is they gave people a button, okay? They gave you a button, and if you pressed the button, the button would flash. The, the, the light would flash in front of you, okay? You hit the button, light would flash. And they made the flash happen a half second after you pressed it, okay? Basically, that same delay you have for uh, sensing things in your brain, okay? And they, people hit the button and over and say, hit the button lots of times, and it would have this half second delay. But people have the perception that it's happening at the exact same time they're pressing the button. Mm -hmm. And their, their brain kind of adapted to this. Okay. Then people kept pressing the button, then all of a sudden the researchers took the delay away. So it, the light lit up instantaneously. So people thought the light was lighting up before they hit the button. That, that the way that they, they tricked their, basically, they had trained these people's brains. And the sensation that, and this trickery that they do that makes it seem like we're in the moment to make people weird them out that like the light was predicting when they were going to press the button, when in fact they were the one pressing the button. Mm -hmm. And this is wild. Like it, re it really messed with people's sense of causality that the things that we do in the world are what affect them and not necessarily the other way around. So it's wild. So that's like a half a second. That's the speed at which you react to things. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the speed of thought or the limit of thought, because there are lots of thoughts that can be swirling around in our head that don't necessarily require me to see something, think something, feel something new. And this is, and, that, and I don't know the speed at which we think. However, if we wanted to say, figure out like how fast, you know, how, how fast does it take for a neuron to fire another neuron within our brain, that might give us an upper limit as to how fast we could potentially think. And that is something like less than a millisecond that it takes for one neuron to fire against another neuron, which causes another neuron to fire and things like that. So it's perhaps possible, and again, I am not a cognitive neuroscientist, so I'd love for people to clarify more of this, that you could think at a rate of a thousand times a second, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we do. So that is the speed limit of thought as best as I could find. Is it possible that some people might have faster uh, thought speeds than others? I was looking a little bit into this because a lot of people ask that question. It's like, do people of certain ages like Mike Bloom? Or slow? <laughs> that man, he's like a he. He might exceed the speed of thought. I'm mm -hmm. sometimes he's a quick he's a quick thinking guy. But the so I I think that in terms of that might have more to do with the structure of our brains and how our kind of the signals route through our brains as we age, as opposed to the speed at which the neurons actually fire. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that speed limit, unless that actual activation time of a neuron um, uh, would change with age, then that speed limit that I'm talking about would be the same. But the things that we might consider to be thoughts is maybe more than just any particular neuron firing to another. It's a much more complex set of things happening. Mm -hmm. um, this, the, the patterns of them as they go through our brains, which can certainly and do certainly get affected with age. Also, when we get tired, you know, that's even 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 not, not even person to person, but moment to moment, day to day. Mm -hmm. All right, Christian, let's go back to Survivor. Josie wants to know. What is your favorite part of Survivor? What is your least favorite part of Survivor? And I get to feel like James Lipton when I ask a question like that. <laughs> that, that is a very James Lipton question. Also like a Larry Christian, King question. what is your favorite part of Survivor? What is your least favorite part of Survivor? I, I kind of like the Larry King version of it because I feel like the Larry King version of the question would be like one, but had like a subtle insult built into it that I'm not sure he knew was an insult. 
I remember mm-hmm. when Larry King would like ask like Jerry Seinfeld, it's like, so you were on Seinfeld, right? It's like, yes. And it and it ended, but it wasn't canceled, right? It just ended. And like Jerry and this famous clip, like Jerry like, Seinfeld's like indignant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's indignant. It's like, do you do you know anything about me, Larry? Do you mm-hmm. know? Did you before this interview, did you look up anything about me? Do you know who I am, Larry? So anyway, that's the Larry King version of the question. But uh no offense to the great Larry King, great late great. But yes, what's the yes? What was the uh the, my favorite part of Survivor? I was shocked when I thought Rob, I don't think I've ever answered this on any of your podcasts together. Yes. I feel we we have podcasted at least a full 24 hours together, if not a lot more than that hmm. at this point. I yeah, like. I am prepared to be dazzled because I feel like I do cannot predict what your answer is gonna be. Oh, so well, hopefully it's not not too mundane. It is. It was the exact the thing that I love most about being on the show was exactly my favorite thing about the show. It was the merch. The merch was the most cool thing that like I feel like I've maybe experienced in my life. Not like the oh I made the merch I'm so excited kind of thing. No, the actual experience of being on the island during the merge was the one of the craziest, most stimulating mm-hmm. and fun things I've ever done because. Those all of a sudden being going from being knowing a handful of people and all of a sudden you're thrust in with a full 13 people. And we were down in the numbers as David's at the merge. And oh, my God, I have to come up with a plan right now. It's going to pull people in so we can get an advantage so that way we can get an advantage and make it through this vote with our David's intact. And uh, and it's not a thing that could ever really make air in some meaningful way. But like. Having to talk to all these people, I was on. I, I, I was. I was trying to get to know them, trying to send the signals I wanted to send to them, try to come up with a plan with them, try to figure out what they would want to do. I would construct a version of the world that was true enough, but helpfully true to me in that moment. So it's sort of like versions of the truth that were floating around with all these people while mm-hmm. trying to figure out what they knew about all these other people and what they knew. All of a sudden, information is flowing to you. Like you're here, you're here, you're feel you're hearing from multiple people about who might have an idol and what does that imply about the relationship with them and those people? I've never been more stimulated intellectually in my life than the merge. It ever was every bit as crazy as I could have hoped it would be, and even more crazy. Like, even though like ultimately we did not pull together some crazy plan for the merge, it was not for lack of trying and was just thrilling and was the most fun. I might've had in my life to be frank. Mm-hmm. Wow. What is your least favorite part of survivor? <laughs> oh, uh, so I loved so much of that experience that the, the, the one experience that really stuck out that I did not like, it wasn't even like the elements, like the rain, like you and I have talked about the rain socks, the rain socks. socks. It's the worst. It's the worst elemental part of the show. I mean, like, mm-hmm. for those who don't know when, you, when it rains, not only are you always wet, and you smell like mildew. You can't make a fire when it's raining because all the firewood gets wet unless you built a butch fire shelter or something, which what could go wrong in such yeah. a such an area? What could go wrong? And so you can't build a fire, which means you can't cook food. You can't cook rice. You, and, and you got to make sure the rice stays dry because that will get mildewy if you ever get anything right. It's mm-hmm. everything, everything comes to a halt when it's raining. And when you had a rainy season, it's it's like it, it, it's, it just comes to a crawl. But that's not the worst thing, I think. I hated the most. Like I remember when we had our loved ones visit, and yeah. um, and the we uh, we I lost the loved ones visit challenge, which I was perfectly happy to lose. I did, did not want to win the loved ones visit. I think only things bad things can come. Being taken along for it is fine, but you know you don't want to win it. And so I was unsurprised at all that we I had lost it. I remember so I think it was me, Gabby, Kara, and Allison. Where the four people we were being voted back to camp, and the other people going to go off and have some barbecue somewhere, and and for whatever reason, it took forever to get us back to the island. I'm like, like guys, we already lost. Why are you just like tormenting us by making it take longer? And mm-hmm. and then the producer, like, and you're not supposed to talk to producers during this time, but they're like, ah, oh, you know, there's lots of this show's complicated. A lot of things are happening. A lot of moving parts. Blah 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 blah. I was like, okay, fine. Then we pull up to camp, and we f- smell the barbecue nearby and i'm like oh no they're doing the floating pontoon barbecue reward right off the beach and i was like i was so incensed 
not because I've smelled the barbecue, not even I missed the reward. I was like, in my head, I was like thinking about the show. I'm like, this is such a cool show. This is so high production value. This is so classy. Everything is together. And it's so interesting. I could talk for years and have talked for years about what a cool experience it was. And this is something so base, so crass as to be like, oh, there are your loved ones on a floating pontoon, a la Don Meehan, uh, to make you jealous. And I remember I turned to the producer and I was like, oh, I understand the real reason why we took so long. Spite. Spite. You wanted to spite us for losing this challenge. I was so mad. And we, so we, I turned to Gabby and Allison and Kara. We all just said, we're just not going to give them anything. We're not going to give them any reaction. We just stomped off the camp and we just went far away from them. So we wouldn't even see them or give them any reaction whatsoever. That was like the one, that was the low point of that. Cause I was just like, you protested. You feel like that's beneath Survivor. Yeah, I thought it was a beneath Survivor. Now, I understand in the past they got good material yeah, out of it. You know, they got Dawn and Brenda in season 26, what they were going for. It, everything else seemed like within the bounds of classiness for the show. And that was just the thing I was like. And so eventually I I, I had hard chart that, that produced her like many months later. I was like, I'm sorry I got mad at you. I just felt mm -hmm. it, was, it was beyond the show. It was, it, yeah, it was you're not. better than it, this. It. Better than this. That's that's what I told him. That's what mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, that was a good answer. Um, all right, let's go from your favorite and worst, uh, least favorite thing about Survivor to Sarah Cupcakes wants to know, what is your favorite piece you've played in an orchestra? I, I love the James Lipton theme to all this. <laughs> this could be a recurring character. Uh, what is your, yeah, anything that's, what is your favorite? What's your least did, favorite? It, is he still alive? He's like 90 something, Christian, right? What or, what do you plan to say to God? <laughs> oh, this is the, in the pantheon of characters, we could have this. Mm -hmm. So favorite piece in an orchestra. Uh yeah, I, so I played in orchestras um for most of most of my life, or at least most of my adultish life. Like, um, and I, I minored in music in college. I was a clarinet player, so I got to be. So in, in, a, in a full orchestra, you get winds and you get winds as well as strings. And I remember near the end of high school, I got to do a tour with an orchestra in Japan. I toured in Japan for about two weeks with, wow. with the youth orchestra. And uh, and we played the Dvorak's New World Symphony. That's symphony number nine. It's actually one of the one of the classics it's one of the it's super well known people might think i'm a classical music school people think might think i'm a plebe for a pleb for for saying this answer but that and it could be just be nostalgia but i honestly i think it, it really shaped a lot of why i ultimately went to like minor in classical music and still be into it it's just one i got to play like the solo for the clarinet solo in the fourth movement and and but it, it there's there's something about not just listening to a piece of music but when you're in the belly of the orchestra, and if you're seated where I'm seated, uh, I am right in front of all the brass. So my body is basically being vibrated out of existence by loud French horns right behind wow. me. And so you're just you're just like which which sounds maybe like a nightmare to some, but to me was exhilarating. That every like, I'm like sure so it's I, exhilarating I, to many. Yeah, I, sure. It was. It just. It, you know, I imagine I've never I've never been to like a like a like a rock concert or like a pop concert, but I just imagine that's as close as I get to what those people might experience from a really loud concert experience. But it, it just but it just being in the middle of it. And so every long, loud chord I would feel and uh, and it's it, so it was just a total experience of performance of feeling the people behind you, but also your solos coming up. Uh, you know, you know, you're 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 performing to uh, to a to an auditorium of uh, to a, a Japanese all girls school. They will laugh if you squeak your clarinet. So it's a, so there's the tension and the resolve of actually performing. And I think you have to experience that with the New World Symphony. And that's why I probably really gravitate toward this late Romantic era of classical music, where there's this low, like loud brass that was really embraced along with lyrical melodies and it's the perfect example of it okay lots of people in the chat are letting us know james lipton has passed away oh, I'm sorry uh, he actually that. died in march of 2020 but not covid yeah he would have been one of yeah that's uh 
you know, I, I, I remember he was like, he was in his 90s, wasn't he? 93, was, he was, 93. Uh, yeah. I remember when I learned that, I was like, wow, he is, uh, you know, he, he he's, he's he's still going, man. Yes. Oh, uh, he did not get famous until really much later in life, it seemed like. Okay. Okay. Well, well, now he has a second wave fame via his recurring character on Rob as a podcast. So <laughs> there's always that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, all right. Um, how about... Um, a question from uh, Tina says, my daughter is eight, interested in robots. What's a good way to introduce her? Any easy to use program recommendations for kids? Yeah, where do you start? Do you start actually in coding? You, you know, you don't necessarily have to start directly in coding, although there have been a lot of ways that people sort of try to sneak teach their kids coding, which is pretty clever. Um, there are lots of apps out there. I, I don't, I'm not going to endorse any products because I've not actually tried them, but I, there, there are plenty of things out there for like, they're like iPad games that are sort of sneak, like coding mm -hmm. teaching. Like you might have a dude that has to jump around, a, uh, a, like jump around on lily pads, but you have to give them instructions in a specific way in order to do that. And sort of, it, it ingrains the idea of procedural coding. That's the that, that that's what those will do. But I'm going to give a sort of a much more simple example, one that requires no computer programs at all. I, I've seen okay. a few examples that you just with a piece of paper. And the idea is sort of like, and it's more about teaching people uh, the process of coding, but not necessarily, but not because it's coding itself is important. It's the idea that robots have to give be given very specific instructions in order to function, and and realizing that they're not very good at interpreting what you want. You got to tell them exactly what to do. Right. And so that's what coding a lot of time is about. And so one thing that I've seen people do is that they will have is that they will make a maze, you know, on a piece of graph paper. You take two pieces of graph paper, you make a maze or you look up one online and then you make it. You have your kid solve the maze, okay? Uh, on the graph paper. And then then you say, "Okay, and if they're they said they're 9 years old, so they're old enough to mm -hmm. write at least a little bit, right?" So if they're old enough to write, you say, okay, now write down, you're going to help me solve the maze. Now write down all the steps to get me to solve the maze. And then I'm going to try to solve it on a completely different set of paper. Okay. I won't even be able to see the maze. Okay. Um, and so can you get me to solve it? And they have to write out the steps very carefully to make you do it. And then you follow, then they read it to you. You know, what's the first step? Then you do it. Then the next step, and you go through it. And if you take your graph paper and lay it over the maze, if you did it right, you solved it. So it doesn't even require an iPad, just requires two pieces of graph paper. And it's the idea is to teach the kid a series of steps. And that's what all an algorithm is, just a series of steps. Same thing that goes on a robot. Mm -hmm. Okay. So graph paper, that's it? That's all it takes to get your kids into robots? Yeah, that in a pencil, or you know, or or, mm -hmm. or or you prick your finger with blood. One of the two. Oh any, my god! Any writing implement, any writing implement that you know suits your fancy. Oh, that got dark. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's stay with, stick with uh, uh, dark thoughts. Okay. Which <laughs> Survivor job title is the worst one for your reputation on Survivor? In the new era, we see people worried about sales reps and attorneys and therapists. Well, I mean, the the clear answer for what seems to be the answer is freaking attorneys, man. It's always yeah. what is I don't even understand. I mean, I, I get it. I get it. Maybe we're going to break this down. OK, it's mm -hmm. attorneys, number one, because I mean, we just saw in this last season, there were three attorneys and all of them lied about it. Yeah. I'm like, that, I, I, well, it's I in fairness, Jake did not lie about it. Oh, did he lie? Not lie? He said he was like a prosecutor. Oh, maybe. A, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. I, I, I think he maybe he did lie about like what kind of lawyer he was. Well, I, I remember thinking like, oh, look, a lawyer who didn't lie about the profession, and then at the end is like, I actually lied about what type of lawyer I am. I'm like, so we can't we can't mm -hmm. escape it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what what are the things that? Oops, all lawyers. Let's do it. Oops, all, yeah, that, you know, wouldn't that be great? Because then none of them would claim they're lawyers. And we just see what they all claim to be. I mean, what like I the way I saw, thought about it, there's sort of three elements that cause people to find a, a profession threatening. OK, like uh, like one is uh, do are they deceptive by, yeah. by profession? Now, I I don't get I don't think that about lawyers, but that's their reputation is that they're, you know, is that is that they're dishonest. Mm -hmm. And so. That's so they have a, there's there's a reputation for that that I don't buy. I mean I I think highly of the profession of the law, but the you so watch number all one. of Better Call Saul. 
Yeah, I did. Multiple I, times. I you, yeah. What, that Better Call Saul is a great, I mean, I, I remember, you know, when people said they were like public defenders after my season, I was like, if you told me that, I would have, you know, I would not have thought you were rich. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen Better Call Saul. You know, he's living out of the back of a nail salon. And, <laughs> and how did he and live so, there? How did he work there? Where do you, where, no, he, but he couldn't stay at Chuck's place in season one. He had to stay at, he had did the he bed sl- there. Did he sleep there? He, he, yeah, he had to move his desk in order to pull down the bed that was oh, yeah. in the wall. Again, why, why would I quibble with you? You've, you've seen it multiple times. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I'm Although not the, valuable, but. Uh, the Academy, Television Academy of Arts and Sciences, zero That's Emmys. Nice. Zero Emmys, entire run. I, and it's not like they all went to White Lotus this year either, so I can't even feel good about that. So yeah. anyway, but it's uh, but it's it's uh, anyway. Uh, uh, sorry, the wound is still raw and it will be raw forever. But mm-hmm. I mean, so like lawyers have this one. There's this reputation they're duplicitous. So oh, you know what? Can people... we go? Can we go back to that? Yeah. So I podcast about Suits since the last time that you and I did one of these. I podcast about yes. all 134 episodes of Suits with Chappelle over on Suits Yourself, and you at one time uh, I had alerted you to this, and you said, "Oh, don't even get me started." You said, "I am not a I... fan of Suits. I dislike Suits so much. I'm sorry. It's Why? Like, you... <laughs> I just." Look, I can take a premise to a degree. I just the, the the sheer premise of it and the ridiculousness of it. I feel like at some point when that Mike went to Harvard. Away, well, <laughs> well, and he picked going to Harvard, right? That he he doesn't even have a law degree. Like right. the entire firm of the, the whole premise is like all in the premiere episodes. I'm spoiling nothing. But the entire premise of this is that this yeah. this guy, this big time guy at a law firm, risks his entire career to let some guy. Be a lawyer who has no law degree whatsoever. I'm in law school. And what is an advantage? His advantage is he's good at memorizing stuff. Yeah. Now why is it like, I mean, look, you know, we do have Google. You don't, you know, it's it's not like people are great lawyers just because they're good at memorizing. Yeah, case but law. he could process this is like a pre he was the first chat GPT. Just process everything really. I, I just I don't buy it. I just I don't buy it. Like the, I mean, there's so many things that make a great lawyer. That have nothing to do with like the fact that oh you can just process a lot of information really quickly you know and 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 the fact that that was uh, anyway I just that premise alone and I just can't even take it and then people the, 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 the whole thing goes on I saw like I saw the first two seasons of Suits Rob yeah two seasons I was enjoying it well enough I think that yeah, I, 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 at the time I, I mean me and my mom would like it and I, I I'd watch it I enjoyed it it's only later I realized how mad it made me it, like mm-hmm. simmered inside me. And I was like, how did I think when when I didn't when I started to like not enjoy the show anymore, I got angry at it. Like, how dare it try to make me go along with this premise for so long? It tricked me so. And so I just and ah, and so it it there's some good things about it that it reveals about the law. I kind of like that they talked about how some people are sort of more like the business side of the law. You know, I think that's that's I like when they I like when shows give you nuance about a profession that you didn't mm-hmm. know was there. Uh, and like, like it's the same thing with like uh, professors, right? You might think that professors all wear jackets like this and I'm not really helping the cause here, but like the professors come in all shapes and sizes in terms of what they do. There are professors who are basically just business. They basically run a business. Their lab is a business and, uh, they, they, they're really good at, just, at they're good rainmakers. They can bring in money and then get pump out good papers. They have a billion postdocs doing their work. Then there are professors who have like one or two grad students who do really good stuff. And there are professors who like to put on a bow tie and give a lecture. Like mm-hmm. there's all kinds of different professors too, just like it's all different kinds of lawyers. Back to survivor lawyers. They think they're rich. They think they're deceitful and they think that they're really smart. I mean, that's the three things, right? And that's why all, and, and so any combination of those things individually, can lead to people being seen as threatening. I think that they see themselves as the being the the, the conglomeration of all of these things, and as a result, they feel the need to lie about it, and they think people don't like them. That's mm-hmm. why I assume is the case. Do you think that part of it is that at the end of Survivor, it's called the jury, and the jury decides on the winner, and then just because of like if they would have chosen like a different word for like the the jury who votes for the winner like uh do you think that it would be quite as big of a deal that to have lawyers because it's just like well that they're, they're used to being in front of a jury I, I never put that together i didn't think of that i mean maybe i i more think it's just a general thing that they're seen as smart and like and deceptive and also don't need the money 
Like that was always a big thing, especially in early Survivor, when there was this there was a stigma of like, oh, that person's rich. Ever since Carl, season three, Carl was bragging about his cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think it became a thing that you're not supposed to talk about how rich you are. And everyone was like, I mean, Gary Hogaboom, the whole thing was like, there are people gonna know that I'm I'm rich, you know. As a result, right. I'm gonna be uh you know, Gary Hawkins and, and get beaten yeah. down. Don't and, watch the know. trust on Netflix, Christian. If you oh, don't like a, this. Is, yeah. So well, it's just outmoded. It's just, I feel like it's outmoded. I mean, like it, the, um, I mean, it almost worked out uh, the opposite way to Mike White's favor. Like he could have, he could have played it off differently. Like it almost did play off his game differently. Where like, I don't need the money. I'm just here for the experience. I've talked to you about this many times. And like that, that endeared him in some ways to a lot of people. So like, yeah. I, I kind of wish someone would have, would turn it around right now. So like, I would love to see a lawyer just come in. It's like, yeah, I'm a lawyer. Like, like, like we do so well, typically, you know, yeah. it's, it's like, yeah. This was like an outlier season. We had three lawyers make it so deep. Yeah, it's weird. I feel like on Survivor and Big Brother too, like it has such like a negative connotation, but I almost feel like that over the course of my life, I feel like that there were more like lawyer jokes and stuff like that. Like I feel like when I was a kid that, you know, I don't know. I feel like that in real life, not Survivor, do lawyers have like a negative connotation? No, I mean, they'll sue all... you, right? It's just like, I guess, I guess so. I mean, but like, I, that, I mean, maybe that's just how I grew if up. If you're anti-lawyer, you get sued. I, I, it's a, I mean, there's, I, I imagine it comes from people who've had a bad experience with lawyers, right? Yeah. That, that's what it, where it comes from. Because like, I, I, maybe I'm fortunate enough in my life to not have had to de deal with a lot of lawyers in a high stress situation yeah. where I have opposing counsel trying to poke into my business. Like if people had a bad experience with a lawyer, I guess that, that, that's a thing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, but that's, there's gotta be some people who studied this. I but mean, don't but you feel like that there's, there's less anti-lawyer sentiment now than there was like maybe like 20 years ago? I feel like that. I mean, that's all your memory of this, the same as my memory, like, oh, you know, like, you know, you know what, 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 what's, you know, what do you call, you know, a bunch of lawyers uh, up to their necks in cement? Not enough cement. No one's making that joke anymore. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it's like, I, I haven't seen it, see that. So I don't think it's a thing. And I think people should embrace it. I mean, the United States has like roughly a million lawyers. I, I looked it up. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's, it, it, you know, they're not all snakes. I mean, I, I, mm -hmm. I think, I think the law is a very important profession that needs to be protected. You know, that's the Chuck McGill in me. What could I say? Yeah. Okay. All right. How about um, a question? Uh, we've gotten some questions live. Can I throw one at you? Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. This is one from Mackie. Would you rather a magic book that told you all the secrets about space or the secrets of the ocean? Ooh, I, I thought this was going to be like a like a like a magic question. Like, do you want all the secrets, <laughs> no. the magic tricks, kind of thing? Oh, the well, secrets I even the, Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering book. Oh yes, I need another one of those. Let's see. Um, of the ocean or of space? Okay, this is easy. Look. It's easy. The answer is space, but I feel like I got to give ocean credit. I feel like if I go on about how awesome space would be, like it's just like burying ocean, sadly, under the water where it is. And so, it, it, but like, I mean, space, you answer the questions of space, you actually mm -hmm. answer a lot of other questions that are completely unrelated to space. You understand the physics of, of everything that goes on around us. You could probably invent a whole bunch of new technologies of things you just learn from the experience of knowing about space. That said, let's talk about oceans. I mean, oceans are awesome. So I'm going to look at space. It's a given easy one. Right. Uh, but oceans completely underrated. And let's just take oceans examples. underrated. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, yes, they are underwater rated. Absolutely. And I'd say that that is people. There's so much cool stuff that goes in the ocean. And I'll just list, rest, restrict it to just like fishes. And oh, by the way, the, the fishes versus fish. Uh, there's, you know, plural of fishes versus fish. For those who don't know, I, I might have talked about it in the podcast before. I apologize if I had a, uh, a, 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 if you say, oh, look at all the fish in that tank. That means all those fish are the same species. Okay. If you have lots of different types of fish, different species of fish, you would say, oh, look at all those fishes. Okay. I was okay. told this by a, by, uh, I, yeah, I was actually told this uh, um, by, by a fish expert that this was the case. Okay. And so every plenty year, of fishes in the sea, plenty of fishes in the sea. That's the way the spray should go. Let's start yeah. right here. Every year, I go to a biology conference called the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology. And every year, I am wowed just by the sheer scope of crazy organisms and animals that are out there. And all the interesting ways that fishes can, can, can eat 
that fishes breathe. I mean, just how they eat, like how did they get the food in their mouths? You know, they can't take their little fish fins and go bah, 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 at least not so easily. And I mean, there, there, there will be uh, different kinds of feeding that they will do. There's things like ram feeding, where if it's a big enough fish, they'll just ram through and then, you know, like fast, fast enough so people can't get out of the way of its mouth. There's suction feeding, and people will put fishes under x-rays um, and, and see, uh, during the process of suction feeding, to see all the structures inside of their body for which they can use to, to create that really quick suction pressure. And I go there as a roboticist for the inspiration. And also I have collaborators there. We, I study how birds move with them. I use mm -hmm. computational tools for how birds move. But I like to see all the fish stuff. And, and, they, and every time I'm always wowed by all the crazy solutions that, have, that these fish have come up with, these fishes have come up with, and, the, uh, like, and, and the, how these structures move. And I'm like, I look at, in comparison at robots, and I'm like, wow, our designs are so uncreative by comparison. Like there are so like it, 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 it is so nice to go to this conference because I'm reminded that not everything is like made out of aluminum. There's all this you know, flexible bones and tendons and structures that create all these interesting solutions to simple problems, such as how does the fish eat? And so imagine if we understand all the forget all of the ocean, just how fish work. Mm -hmm. And so it would 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 be so interesting. It would give you me so much information for how to build a cooler robot, even one that's not even in the water. If there's all kinds of ways we can apply it to other interesting designs and engineering. Okay. Brooke says, yeah, but I'm only trying to date one species human. So there's plenty of fish in the sea. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Correct. You know, Brooke, ding that. That's very, that's very, 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 um, yeah. very, very well put. Just an aside to go back to space, though, I'm still looking forward to the day when you start watching For All Mankind, and then I'll just okay. get like All a right. text thread. All right. You got it. I, I, okay. I'm, I'm going to, this year, I will commit to you, Rob. I will watch it sometime this year. Yeah. <laughs> just watch a couple soon. episodes. If you don't like it, you yeah. don't, don't stay with it. No, that's fine. I mean, I, I mean, what, isn't uh, Killers of the Flower Moon? Isn't that also on Apple TV? Yes, Plus Apple TV like Plus. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, so, I, so I don't have it. So I, I have to get it to watch Killers of the Flower Moon anyway. I, I, I probably, I, I told you my Killers of the Flower Moon story. I, I, I don't think. think so. Oh, oh. So, um, I, the, I remember one a couple years back, right when, uh, the COVID shots came out, and uh, Emily and I decided to finally go on a vacation. We been vaccinated. We went out. And we just, we managed to book a vacation to uh, outside of uh, outside of out in Oklahoma. We actually went. Okay. We wanted to kind of get away from it all. There's this whole uh, there there's out in Pasca, Oklahoma. There is a there, there's a there's a woman. Her name is Reed Drummond. She's better known on the Food Network as the Pioneer Woman. Uh, she is a one of the sort of a famous recipe maker. And now she has a whole Food Network sort of empire going on. And she lives out there. And has a whole series of businesses that she owns, like like restaurants and um, and hotels that you can stay at that are kind of hard to get uh, that that are hard to book. And mm -hmm. we managed to book, and we she's a fan of the Pioneer Woman. She got her all her books signed by the Pioneer Woman. And so finally, we managed to actually get in the middle of COVID stuff. Uh, you know, we, we were able to 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 get a booking to go to the hotel, and um, which was incredibly rare to get this. And so we went out there. And I, we rented a car to go out to Pahaska, the tiny town from, from Tulsa. We parked the car. We, we stay in this town for like three days. I leave my car there. We don't have to go anywhere else. I come back to where I parked the car, and it is surrounded by the set of Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh, my God. The, the entire set sprung up around it. And we took a photo. I think I put it up on, on Twitter. Uh, the photo of we came back to our car. It's like you have these old timey uh, power poles and uh, and, and old timey storefronts, and you have like our rental <laughs> car, mm -hmm. like on like some Kia or something in the middle of it. It's like okay, this is funny. So yeah, how, so how long uh, did it take to get it out? It's uh, the, the, the car. Thankfully, I think they must have had some deal with the city that you're able to kind of just drive out of there. But I was shocked that like they they didn't like tow it or something. You know, if they're doing all that business mm -hmm. on the street, but maybe they were just working on the facades of the buildings yeah. and they were able to let it go. But I was like, what is this? I mean, looked around for the signs and said, Killers of the Flower Moon. Is Apple that Leo? <laughs> that, 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 would, that, that would be funny to get, to not get recognized in any way, shape, or form in Tiny Pahuska. Yeah. Uh, let alone as Leonardo DiCaprio. 
yeah, I did get uh, re- I did get I did get recognized in Alaska though. That was that was a trip. Yeah, I mean, too bad uh, that he wasn't filming. Don't look up. You could have stepped in to be the math double. Yeah, I want to be my math double. I I tell my students that story every time. Like, you nobody anybody in the industry. I want to get into the math stunting industry. I got my big break. <laughs> Okay. All right. We were talking about space. Mike Christensen wants to know how do space telescopes like the JWST or Hubble take photographs? It's my understanding. It's not like there's a camera in there. It's just a bunch of sensors. How is that data turned into pictures? And is that actually what it looks like? Or is there some artistic liberty happening? So uh, great question. Um, this is, is an astute question. One thing I'll point out is that Mike you know, is a man of no- science. He's a man of science. I'm sure he knows. And so, but yeah, I, but I'm sure he also knows that a camera is a sensor. So even, you know, the camera on your, on your phone, you know, that is a sensor is sensing the world, taking in that information and processing it somehow and giving it to you. Okay. So even a camera would be a sensor, but there, the greater truth of what they're saying is right. That if you went out and looked at the stars from where the J, JWST telescope is, you would not see what it sees. You can't see what it sees. All of the light that it is being that is being fed is beyond our human vision. As a result, um, you know, you might say, well, so it's being processed and changed and somehow. So is that like an artistic liberty being taken? Because all those cool, colorful images you see from Hubble and all these deep space things, yeah, those aren't the colors. Those are false colors. So is it just, you know, a pink guy with a paintbrush, you know, some woman with spray paint going, psh, or, you know, MS paint, you know, going fill with whatever color? No. It's actually a logic to it. There's a, there, there is an, there's a very, and, and it is very much analogous to what you would see if you could see in that spectrum. Um, so we have a limit to what we can see with our eyes. It's basically right between red and purple. You know, those are different wavelengths of colors between red and purple that we can see. Those are the colors of the rainbow. Everything, that's our visible light spectrum, which is this tiny fraction of the total spectrum of all the electromagnetic stuff out there. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, you know, X-rays are super are super super on the high end. Ultraviolet is on the ultra side of the of the frequencies of violet. Infrared is under red, and it goes blah blah blah. And so the the, the, the JWST uh, takes photos in infrared, which we can't see. Um, but a good way to think about how what it's actually doing, it's kind of like one of those thermal imaging cameras. Okay, yeah, the thermal imaging cameras you can't actually see heat, but what, but it has a logic for saying, oh, if a thing is a certain col- a certain temperature, it turns it into a certain color for you to see, right? And it's the same thing with these telescopes. It, what it'll do is it'll say, hey, here's the range for which the telescope, tele- telescope can see from this frequency to this frequency. And this is the range that you can see from this frequency to this frequency. And it sort of scales what it can see down to what you can see. And so that way it gives you kind of an idea of what you would see. And, and so... So it is, there is a logic to it. It is not just artistic liberty that makes that decision. Okay. All right. Augie wants to know, I am very interested in the game theory of Survivor. That being said, I'm very bad at math. Do you have any recommendations on how to learn more about the theory slash strategy side of Survivor uh, that is light on the mathematical side of things? Yeah. And and, uh, this is a great question, Augie. And I will say that overall, Survivor strategy on the whole is not super mathematically developed beyond your ability to count votes. Uh, I mean, there isn't a formula that you can plug in that's going to be that's going to drastically improve your ability to excel at the game, unless that 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 is beyond counting to ten. Your ability to count the votes to be better better than other votes, it's not going to drastically improve with just some mathematical understanding like that. That's the hope. That would be awesome. You know, there are moments in my life where I'm like, you know, robots are fun, but it would be cool to develop a survivor research program to see what it would what it would take to you know what kind of mathematical underlying frameworks you could use to do better at the game. Um, there are certainly ways math can help you. There are certainly individual puzzles that uh, mm-hmm. that you can do really well. And we talked at great length about a few of them on our last podcast during Survivor 45. We were talking about the the math operator puzzle and we were talking about other kinds of puzzles too and different boat split the different sort yeah. of boat maths right uh to to uh, much to the use of my ipad and the but i but in terms of things that you could learn that are so so there's a lot of stuff you learn that's not very mathematically focused i mean and what's even like that useful i mean uh, other than like, some of the basics like oh 
you know, have allies, you know, maybe don't make them mad, you know, don't, uh, <laughs> you know, make sure if people want to get rid of you, maybe they should go. What can you do? I, I think that there is something to um, getting information out there. It's like a strategy that's not mathy. Like the, the idea of, if you ever watch like police interrogations, like they're really popular on YouTube. I'm not sure that, that they're, they're always, always that fun to watch, but like, mm-hmm. You can't I believe be a Jeff good Cops has talked about this on on the On Fire podcast. About oh, really? He has he? He is, loves to watch police interrogations. That's you know that all of a sudden his tribal council demeanor makes a lot of sense. Yes, this is all coming yes. together. At least maybe not in recent seasons, but an older Jeff when he would hold your feet to the fire. That's where they come from. Now he's all good cop. You know, we we need a little bit mm-hmm. more Jeff bad cop these days. That's that'll be my suggestion for for yeah. Jeff. But I mean, but a lot of good uh, uh, interrogations it doesn't have anything to do with good cop, bad cop per se. My, my understanding, and again, I'm not an expert here, but just that that you you have you need, like there are principles like knowing more information than the person you're talking to, and you can ask them a question that seems innocent, but how they answers it answer it can either confirm or deny information you already know. It can tell you something about their intentions. What are they revealing to you? Um, I mean, I remember I I. I uh, this this was not a good idea, but I remember like with near the end of my game with Davy. I remember Davy told me there was this crazy shot clock idol, and it was something that I I we had not seen that part of Ghost Island yet that it didn't exist. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the corollaries to it on season thirty five weren't very strong, so I was like, I guess, I guess it could be a thing, but it was a wild thing that he was telling me about. And so like I didn't interrogate him per se, but I was like I, uh, I but I was like, this is so weird. So I remember the thing I did in that moment was like I said to Davey, so Davey, uh, I wanted to determine if this was a real thing or not. And my reasoning was that if it was a real thing, he would have to play it at this tribal council anyway. OK, so therefore he knows he's safe. So I need to construct a scenario for which I would ask him like and get an answer which would determine does he actually think he's safe or not. And so what I did was is, is I was like, hey, I've heard your name thrown around, Davey, which was true. And it's like, you know, should I vote with these people since you're going to be safe anyway? And he said, absolutely, yes, that's a great idea. I was like, oh, wow. And that was my way of saying, oh, this is actually he was safe. You know, he's telling mm-hmm. the truth. Whatever he's got, it's going to be safe, this tribal council, because why would he throw votes on himself like this? So that's sort of like a, a logical deduction based upon information I had and the way he responded to confirm that. Now, the reason I thought it wasn't a good idea is because I just, I just trusted Davey in the free given begin with. He had given no reason not to trust him. I think it was just so weird. I was so blown out of my mind at that point that I, I felt the need to do that when I should have been saying, should I trust Mike White? Obviously I shouldn't. He should go home and, and write HBO shows instead. But I think that it's not a mathematically intensive way to go about survivor strategy. It's mm-hmm. a bit of logic. And I think there are a lot of games out there that are kind of like that. Um, that if you want to practice with, I have, I've tried them, but, uh, but I think that there, there are things like that that are, underappreciated for how good they are uh example from another season rob uh was sierra sierra easton in her first season on blood versus water did mm-hmm. something like this to katie collins in her season she kind of like called a bluff and got katie collins to to basically flop on it and mm-hmm. uh and call her out like there's good stuff like that yeah I feel like that the only places where like the mathematical side of things is coming from, where you're trying to figure out like the probability of like, uh, you know, vote split or who has an idol and uh, like, what's, what's the best move in it, like based off of like probability. But I feel like that's not a very big part of it. Like, I think you could take a look at like some of like the all time greats of survivor and they're not exactly mathematicians. No, it would actually be really interesting if there was like a game breaking strategy that emerged from this. I, I think there's the possibility of it, but I feel like the circumstances are such that the uh, that they have not ar- ar- arose. Like, with, I feel like there's been this thing which comes up like for so many seasons. And I know many people have talked about it and thought about it, like where you use the revote rules to some crazy advantage in the game so that way you can turn the turn the tide of what you otherwise would have lost like i think evie talked about doing this with xander on Mm -hmm. her season if she had played his extra vote which ultimately he didn't do but like we we, like that would have been something really interesting where the ability to have thought through a lot of the possibilities uh would have led to a different fundamentally different outcome for a single vote but it's so on the edge uh Mm -hmm. and if you and if you're into that just do it because it's fun 
That's why I do this stuff. It's fun. I'm here with you, Rob, because it's fun to talk about science and do the iPad math because it's fun. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for being here to have some fun with us. I know that the listeners are having fun and I am. So uh, we appreciate it, Christian. Well, thank you. Thank okay. You. Jeremy wants to know, speaking of math and game theory, do you ever play poker? Do you enjoy watching it? I used to love watching poker. Back, we got poker had that ascendancy. I feel like in the late aughts, Rob, sure. like mid late aughts, like the era of like the Chris Moneymaker, Money yeah, like around yeah. like two thousand three, two thousand four. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mid, yeah, sort of mid aughts, mid early aughts. I enjoyed it then uh, when it was a big thing. I would watch the World Series of Poker when it was on. I played poker like twice in my life, ever. Yeah, I, it's it's actually something that. Like it would be actually fun to do. Like if I was ever like hanging around with Tyson or something like that, because he's like an actual poker player. Like if he would ever permit me to be at the table with him and get shown the ropes by like those folks or like Adam. I, I like when I saw Adam at your event in, in New Orleans, I was like, I was like, Adam, I gotta ask you about poker. I'm just endlessly curious about it, but have not embraced the actual learning of yeah. it. And so I find it interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's fun. I would love to play in like a game with friends, but like to the little bit that I've like gone and like been in tournaments and stuff like that, like you have to grind. It is long. I mean, I, I guess that maybe like some of these uh, survivors like Tyson or Rob, like you're, it's, you know, these games go on days, these tournaments. So, you know, you're, you're in there and you see like people like having to get like, like, chiropractors and like massages and like uh <laughs> you know it's work yeah it, it's it, it and i'll tell you it, and that's so that's your she actually did some i'm curious about your experience from so they actually yeah i used to go to reno uh jason somerville uh used to have us out there it's, and so that was very fun but you know i i really like i, I like to have play like in a friendly game but i i don't really enjoy like big tournament poker like I, I could see myself like if I was able to shut off my life for like whatever weekend was necessary to do it, I would love to try that experience because like it, to me, it's like I told you last time how I like playing blackjack on like low stakes blackjack. And yeah. that's a grind, too. If like if you were to ever do like uh, like card counting, that's a grind. And uh, like you're you're not like getting winning like some giant hand on your own. You're like if you're playing on your own, you're like grinding out a little bit by a little bit because you earn some minor edge, mm -hmm. and so that it, it's how it's how it works. If they even let you play that long, um, but the but like with but the I but I do enjoy that element of can I just make the right move over and over and over and over again? Yes, any and not let any one hand get me down. Mm. Like it's about the long game and really trying to grind it out. Like that to me, I would love to try that. And maybe it would suck, but I feel like that would be something that would be fun to learn. And and really just it, and it's just sort of the the naked competition between you and this person across the table for which mm -hmm. you are vulnerable to being read and destroyed by. That sounds exhilarating, at least to experience. Um, you know, I, I but so like, that, that's that's interesting. So anyway, yeah. that's, that's that's my thought on poker. Okay. Uh, Dolores says, uh, Christian, you should, you should consider going on Deal or No Deal Island. Um, maybe Rob, Boston Rob, give me some po po poker pointers while I'm out there. What? What? So, okay. Deal or No Deal Island. Someone, had, Rob, I'm going yeah. to need to you to explain to me the premise. Yeah, of I don't Deal really know no the Deal premise Island. of Deal or No Deal Island. Uh, from what I understand, I think people like go and find like um, there's like part where you're on an island and you go find the briefcases and then you bring them to. Um, Sophia uh, Vergara's uh, ex-husband, um, and then the banker makes you an offer, and you accept it or not. So it's like deal or no deal, but you're running around on an island. That's yes, the yes. Hence the name. Hence, okay, all right. So at least it's well, it's well named. At least we understand it from the name. It's not not difficult to get. Yeah, deal or no deal. Like I. Uh, I remember a long time ago, I tried to do some deal or no deal math. Um, like I was, I was, I was trying to find a database of d banker offers to see if I could determine if there was an actual logic to the banking. Some people online said they had a formula for it. They're liars. I don't think they actually had mm -hmm. one because I tried it out. It didn't make any sense, but I didn't. So I was curious, like what was there was, because if you had some formula to say, this, these are the cases on the board. This is what the banker offers. Uh, the, um, then you could actually do some metagaming of it, but I think it's just 
what the producers thought would be a fun offer to give, I feel is what they do. So mm-hmm. and, yeah. And so I found I, I so I, I feel like I was disillusioned with the concept of deal or no deal when that was you the wanted case. it to be an algorithm. You didn't like that it was like some guy with a cigar, like offer him 12k. That's uh you, you know, maybe call me an outlier on this issue. <laughs> I would love some underlying logic to the offer. You know, it's like because at which point and that's a different game, right? You know, if, if, if the guy with the cigar, then you're not playing the algorithm, you're playing the dude. You know, yeah. it's like you're, 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 you know, poker, you don't play your hand, you play your opponent, right? Play the and man. So, play the man. And so they, they need to play the banker. So imagine now that would be an interesting game if there was metagaming to play the banker to get you an offer, like you had to like give him the stink eye, I don't know, to like, you know, to bluff. Hey, then that'd be cool. I'm going to give you the stink eye. <laughs> I, All right, son. So I'm assuming that deal or no deal island deal island is being covered on the Robin's podcast series of, of course, podcasts. Of course, correct? of course, yeah. So, so like, so, so who's co- who's covering this? Oh uh, well, look, look, you'll have to tune in for deal oh. or no deal island coverage. Oh, okay, all right. So to, to know, to know. I mean, okay, I think the I, really the question is with that we don't really know what exactly. What, is it a serious show? Is it like uh, is it a wacky show? Yeah, so I am confused, Rob. I'm confused because what, what are you like, confused about? There were there were rumors because you I can say this because you discussed it on your yes. on your podcast when you were yes. you were talking about rumors of Traitor season two. Yes, people. Yes, and Rob was like rumored to be on there. I don't know if I have any yes. inside information or anything, but like yeah, he's he was reported to be, on. to be on there. But I don't know if he was maybe not. He was already gone, and people were like, oh, Boston Rob's not around. He must be on this. But he was on the Dealer No Deal Island. So maybe he went off to some other show. Maybe that's what he did instead. So I was curious. So like, why would, I don't know. I guess maybe it's easier. I was like, I'm imagining a world where Boston Rob had to choose between Trader Season 2 and Deal or No Deal Island. And he chose the I latter. think he chose but, correctly. Because we talked about this on, we did a feedback show on the Traders on, with Michelle Fitzgerald earlier today. And we were just talking about like, uh, like kind of like bombastic, bombastic personalities on the traders and even if they're not a trader i i feel like uh that they it turns into like a big pile on like once like uh you know you have like a you know a, a moment where like rob's not just gonna like uh sit and play nice like he's gonna ruffle some feathers and then that always gets turned around into getting banished so i actually don't think that the traders is a great uh spot for boston rob yeah, I, I mean, but also like, there's a whole threatening profile of Boston Rob. He's one of the, I mean, he's the only, I mean, he, there's there's only a handful of household names coming out of the reality show world, and Boston Rob is one of them. Johnny Bananas is a, his name I know, even though I don't watch the challenge. Mm-hmm. That might be another one, but it's like that's, a, but that's, yeah, I can see that might not be the best role for him. And maybe as as long as he's, I imagine he'd be getting hopefully some, some like, good compensation. Also, like violence. Tony, I I, th- I think would be bad on the traders. He would just be calling people out constantly. I feel and like and and people will get mad at him. I mean, like I just imagine him and Cat. I just imagine everyone basically being cast to Tony on mm-hmm. that thing. And the difference is that they would just banish him, or if, if they had the power, just murder him at night. Yeah. So, anyway. Okay. All right. So Bobby Hall wants to know. I'd love to hear Christian's thoughts about why the video game Baldur's Gate Three has been so successful. Do you have thoughts on Baldur's Gate Three? I gotta be honest. I don't really know what Baldur's Gate. I don't even know about Baldur's Gate Two. You know what? You're you wouldn't be the only one, Rob. So Baldur's Gate One and Two came out in like 1999. So it's been a while. And uh, and it's funny this question came in because Emily and I have been. Uh, just suddenly hooked on watching let's plays videos of Baldur's Gate three. It's like an adventure. It's like a, it's a Dungeons and Dragons based adventure game. And is it uh, violent? Cause should my kids play it? Oh, your kids should absolutely not play this game. Okay. Do not uh, have your kids play this game unless you want to have some very awkward conversations with them. Before Why is there, is there like uh like adult stuff happening? Yes, adult stuff um, very much can happen in this game. Um, but well, is, is that why people it, like it so much, you sickos? You, you, you know, um, people can Google the game for themselves to know the answer to some of these questions. But it, it's nominally, it is a fantasy game. It's like Dungeons and Dragons. And um, and I played Dungeons and Dragons in college. I think I talk, we talked about this briefly in one of the mm-hmm. previous Ask, you know, Ask Pod Chat podcasts here. And I, I remember... Uh, back this was back in like the early early mid aughts, 
I would go off to a dorm room with my with my friend Nathaniel, and he would be the dungeon master. It would play all four years. Uh, all my other friends would make fun of me for playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Emily would laugh at me playing Dungeons and Dragons. Everyone would play would laugh at Dungeons and Dragons. Now Dungeons and Dragons is suddenly surprisingly cool for people. It is now no longer you are a, a social leper if you play Dungeons mm-hmm. and Dragons. And in no small part because of Baldur's Gate, because Baldur's Gate is like it's it's so popular. It was winning all these Game of the Year awards uh, uh, because it's so crazy. And it's actually interesting because it's a game where it's not just about fighting monsters. It's a game about making decisions. Um, you know, you might go up to uh, you know you might go up to a uh, uh, to to a, to an evil witch, and you could decide to you know you know defeat her or you know just walk away from her or decide to help her. And the implications of what you decide to do will actually reverberate through the plot of the rest of the game. And that's to me, is what always been missing from games like this. I normally don't like playing games like this. I would play some and they're fine. Uh, but I like having choice in my games. I like being able to do whatever I want and not being told what to do. And often these plot-based games, you, you gotta follow the plot along. You gotta end up at the same, same end point. So how much choice can you have? And this game was so intricate in the amount of choices that they programmed into the game that it actually is really compelling for me to 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 watch and watch see how people approach it differently. Yeah, uh, a quick search reveals uh, that there were intimacy coordinators on the set of Baldur's Gate Three. I didn't know that specific detail, but it color me unsurprised. Um, there, so let's just say that there are opportunities. So like. Uh, opportunities to romance basically any any character in the game should you mm-hmm. choose okay. if you go down that path. Wow. So uh, the, the, so ra- romance is always an option, it seems. Um, but I'll tell you, the, the 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 people who made this game, it honestly is like it, it does capture like it, the internal um, mental image that you might get when you're playing Dungeons and Dragons. Now the thing about Dungeons and Dragons, people, why people, a lot of people find it so lame, is you see, watch people play it, and it is so embarrassing to have people trying to put on voices and role play. I, I didn't even like doing that. I hated that part of the game. I just wanted to roll dice and buff up my character to be awesome at fighting, and I swing swords or whatever cast spells. Mm-hmm. Um, it's embarrassing to kind of watch people do it sometimes. See, that's the part I like. I get. I, I didn't like rolling the dice. Oh, see, so that see, you're you're more of a role play guy. I was never a role play guy. I was mm-hmm. the game lawyer. I was the guy doing the calculations. I'm the guy who programmed my graphing calculator to tell me the exact attack I should do that would optimize my damage output. Yeah, that was me at the table. Less fun to be around. But so, but like internally in your head, you're imagining these scenes as they're happening, and people you could be creative about what you want to do. You can see because you're because you're only limited by the creativity of the dungeon master or what they'll allow. You know, oh, there's a there's a door right there. Oh, I'm gonna try to pick the lock. Oh, I'm gonna use that barrel and try to smash it into the door. Oh, I'm gonna take my friend and then toss him off of a cliff into the door. You know, you, you, all kinds of crazy things you could try to do, and and the dungeon master may or may not allow it. And the game did a very good job of allowing you all kinds of crazy options. I mean, not the least of which, they give you the ability. There's like there there are certain characters who have spells that allow that allow them to talk to animals. So. They, the game went through all the trouble of every time you come across an animal, you can talk to that animal. And that animal has its own individual voice actor that they hired to do that animal's voice. Wow. So there's a random squirrel, you can talk to it. There's three rats in the corner, you can talk to any of those three rats, and they'll all have different characters and different, and different voice actors for them. So it's incredibly intricate, and the choices matter, and the story was well done. And I don't like story-based games, and I like, you know, I liked it anyway. So it's actually really intoxicating. I think it's going to make Dungeons and, Tra- Dungeons and Dragons actually pretty popular. Okay. All right. Lucas Thomas, speaking of animals, what are your thoughts on robotic snakes or worms? Oh, I have. So, yes, I have a history with robotic snakes, a little bit of a history with robotic snakes. Um, so the idea behind uh, robotic snakes and uh, worms is, is I, I'm, I'm less familiar with the worms, but the principle is still the same. Like the sort of the promised idea of a robot snake is that snakes can go a lot of places people can't. Like, I'm, like they, you, snakes can actually climb trees pretty well sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and snakes can jump out of trees. Uh, they're flying snakes. There are, and, and the idea would be if you had a, a disaster area, like a 
a bunch of rubble in a collapsed building, you could send a snake, a robotic snake to slither in and look for survivors. And I remember giving my first talk at a conference. I happened to be in Baltimore where around where my family lives and my dad and family came out to see my talk I was giving. And it happened to be the same session as the robot snake talks. And my dad was completely unaware of the robot snake uh, talks as a field and he hates snakes and, and he was like freaking out a little Why bit. Why did it have to be robot these, snakes? It, 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 it's always, it always has to be them. And I told him, it's like, Oh dad, it's like, he's like, well, it's like, why would you want a robot snake? It's like, well, you know, what if you're in a collapsed building, there's a snake that can come rescue you. And he said, if a robot snake comes to rescue me, I want to die. I think was his response. You know, he'd rather die than be rescued by a robot snake. He's not <laughs> like that. So it's not even a real snake so so, i'll tell you there is an understandable reaction i'll tell you i've seen all kinds of reaction to robots i mean we have walking robots in the lab and and you get a variety of reactions to people who see them in person you know sometimes people like people like whoa like they're like like, that's awesome because we have we have a humanoid robot that that it, it starts crumpled up in a little ball and then in order to get up it actually kind of like pushes off the ground with its hands and launches backward onto its feet and so it's really kinetic and energetic and like, and it, it really, it gets people, it gets people's eyes wide when they see it. And um, some people are, are amazed. Some people are a little like step back and they're starting to be too close to the robot. And that's a good instinct to not be too close. And some people just freak out. Like, just like they have to like almost leave the room because it's so creepy to see anything remotely biological looking move like a robot that people don't respond well. So that's something I got to be aware of every time I give a tour. Um, and I kind of get it. It's kind of like an uncanny valley of 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 human behavior. But in robot snakes, um, that that's the application. And I happen to like one of my my background in robot snakes. I worked in a lab that that dealt with them. There's a lot of labs that are that 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 do the math behind them. Uh, I do want to highlight a particular professor who was one of, on my on my thesis committee back in grad school. And he's he, he is he's kind of like he's just a wizard when it comes to this robot snake math. That's like what he's known for. And he gives these wondrous talks where he never made math look so pretty on a slide. It's like the math morphs with like when, like when, when two mathematical terms turn into three, they will kind of split apart and move. It's just gorgeous. And then they will fade into these beautiful vector plots. It's crazy. And I've always admired his ability to, to communicate that stuff. And, and what he studied was the math for how to make snakes move. And it's called geometric mechanics. And the simplest possible snake that you can come up with are basically just three are, are three what we call little links. They're imagine like three piece, three body parts that are connected by two joints. It's called a three link swimmer. And he studied how you would take this very this simple three link robot. It's like just it's basically like a imagine like a like a trifold door that has like two hinges. Mm-hmm. You're looking at it from above and it can move like that. That's what it is. And and the math and it's basically developed the math for how you would make these things wiggle so the snake would move forward. And uh, so that math is called geometric mechanics. And so it's a really interesting application of high level math. And I'll tell you, that's just the the tip of the iceberg of what he uh, has covered in his career uh, of applying math to different biological principles. Um, My favorite example is uh, um, spider web, uh, spider web sensing. And he applied. Yes. So like a spider is in the middle of the web. Imagine that stereotypical web that you think of when you think of a spider web where it has a bunch of main spokes and then sort of wrapped around like sort of spiral of connecting uh, of of connecting bits. Now, a spider, while it has a lot of eyes, can't see very well and it's hanging out in the middle of its web. And then a fly hits into the web somewhere. And yet that spider knows exactly where and how to go grab that fly before it, it, it wriggles free, even though it can't see. So it is sensing the vibrations in the web in order to figure out which way it landed. But that's actually not a very obvious thing to figure out how it does that. Because all of these different web connections are connected to other connections. So it's not, they're, they're all vibrating each other. So it's not going to necessarily be obvious where it came from. Everything's vibrating when a, when, when a fly hits the, hits the web. So he is, his group derived the math to determine based upon just, uh, just sensing the center of the web where, uh, how you would figure out where a fly would hit it. And he did the coolest, craziest thing I, I'd seen to show this, is that he made his own spider web out of yarn. 
in wood and with little sensors in the middle. And he turned it into a heart where you could pluck wow. any little string on the, it's, uh, it's, it's called spider harp. It might be spiderharp.com actually. You can see it. And you could pluck any one of these little strings all around. And then the sensors in the middle will detect which string you plucked and therefore give you a different note. So you can have a wide variety of notes, even though you only have six little places where you're in the middle where the, each of these spider legs are sensing it, or six or eight, I forget, I think uh, that he used, but I think it was eight. And people, and so he actually had a musician do performances on the spider harp. And so you can find these on YouTube. So anyway, so like robot snakes are cool. The math is really neat behind them. They're not, they're not application ready. There are some neat things, but the spider harp is cool. Uh, they had it on Jimmy, they had the, the robot snake on Jimmy Fallon and crawled up Jimmy Fallon's leg. It was pretty cool. I mean, yeah. That's another thing. What would you recommend more for our listeners to check out next? The uh, spider harp video or Baldur's Gate 3 Let's Play? So the spider harp video is good for a quick viewing. If you don't want to do, if you want to forget all of your earthly obligations for, for several for mm -hmm. dozens of hours, check out the Baldur's Gate Let's Play. That's okay. how, that's my recommendation. All right. Um, Alex from Roswell wants to know, my wife and I are making our first trip to London. Any recommendations where to eat? So when I went to London, I made the, mis the mistake of thinking, oh, I will get things that people know about in London, like fish and chips. Mm -hmm. And it's fine at best. The fish and chips and mushy peas. I, you know, that I, it's okay. I was like, what, what, where's the food? I want, I want some delicious food. Uh, I realized the Indian food was amazing. I discovered my love of Indian food uh, on a research trip to London. I was working in a in a in a in a, in a bird research barn for two weeks, and I yeah. found in London there's some great Indian restaurants. And now I now I really enjoy Indian style food. So, okay, so try the Indian. Go, try the Indian food. The international food in general. The people setting up shop. I mean, think of it. I, my thing is, think of it not as London, think of it as a major city that's a hub of lots of different cultures that would set up restaurants there. So don't go there looking for things that, oh, this is the stuff that's good in London. London, it's the world's are... food court. Yeah, that's, 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 that's what I think about. I mean, I think about like, like, you know, people talk about Ethiopian food in like DC, apparently is a thing, right? I think that's a, like, that's a thing that people know about. Matt and Franny, you're like, going to go on a date there. Exactly. And then I was like, when, I was, when they said that, I'm like, oh, yep, they know what's going on. They get it. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, just go for, look, look for exotic international style foods. I would, re I'd recommend. Okay. Nate wants to know, has, how has being on survivor affected your ability to enjoy the show? Being a very analytical person. I'm curious to hear the differences in how you watch process and enjoy what's going on. Well, I think, well, has it, it affected it your experience? hundred percent. It has hundred percent. It has, it's, it's, it's hard to view it the same way. Uh, as I did before at the show, I went on the show. Um, and I cherish the moments that I feel like I felt like when I was before I was watching, well, before I went on, yeah. where it's sort of just the, like the, what's going to happen next kind of feeling. And you're just rooting for a character. Um, because yeah, it's it easy, to, easy to get, yeah, go on, Rob. What yeah. was your experience? You, you, well, you, you went through this. Yeah. Because uh, that, uh, I guess I feel like I'm a little jealous of, because, you know, I, I had my experience so early on. So, there's no, really only four seasons of Survivor that I feel like that about. And I feel like that everything else is a little bit like less of like that, you know, that the sausage is made. I mean, if, if I mean, I know that you have listened to the evolution of strategy, but, you know, I, I probably romanticize the, you know, first four seasons of the show way more than I do any of the seasons uh, that come after just because that my experience of being on the show like drastically changes that. Like Big Brother, you know, uh, Big Brother Two, Big Brother Three, like I could go on and on and on, and and there's never been a Big Brother season like uh, since that, since either of those that I cared about remotely as much as uh, those first uh, two seasons of you know Big Brother in its current format that that I watched. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm probably like um, you know, I don't know if jealous is the right word. But I feel like that you got to experience so much more of the catalog of the show in the way it was intended to be experienced than somebody like I did. 
I, 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 I get it. I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, because like I, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes because, yeah, I mean, the show was a very different show in your first four seasons when it was out there. I mean, it was more of the pop culture phenomenon than it was this evolving game that it, that it sort of gravitated toward eventually. But like it, but it was all sort of canonical. Like I could follow it for longer. And um I'm very. I feel honestly very lucky uh, for to have gotten this sort of the background as I did watching the show. Like as much as I in my head, you know, it would be great if I got on when I first started applying, and that didn't t- took years. But in hindsight, it was is actually really great. Uh, the timing was, uh, was good, and but in terms of my enjoyment of the show, like I got to experience the evolution all the way through basically season thirty five, which I think is a. a I think that that's a lot of the evolution of the major game. And I got, and when you're, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, there's a higher than average chance you're a survivor fan. And so like you probably have some uh, internal view of what these people are like and how they meant to you when you watch them. Like we, like you internal, like I I'm sure you internalize some moments of when you were watching like Sue Hawk speech you probably remember where you were in life at that point. Uh, and, yeah. I'll, I will until the day I die. Yeah. I mean, and so it's like, I like, I'll remember where I was when I was watching Steven and token sheens. I'll remember where I was when, uh, you know, when, uh, when, you know, when I was voting in camp for Cambodia, I like, I, I, I'll never like by day in survivor Cambodia was like, we were voting for the, for the people to come back. I was like in the middle of that crazy robotics challenge I was telling you about. So by, so like, I like at like, like at night I'd be watching like survivor know-it-alls and like voting on the Cambodia ballot. Like we had that cultural experience Now you watch it now. So what is it like now? Um, like I still enjoy the show, but it is not, not only sort of like how the sausage is made, like it doesn't ruin it to me that I know how it's made. If anything, when I went out to the show, one of the things I thought that was so cool was like, Oh yeah, all this makes sense. Like seeing how it all works was super interesting. Like, oh, there's a wall of cameras over there. You're filming me? Of course. Of course you'd have a wall of cameras. Get all the different camera angles. Oh, is that a GoPro on the ground right there? Oh, that's so clever how they put a GoPro on the ground to get that shot. That's really neat. Um, and and But it, what, when I'm watching the show, I think it's the characters. What I'm doing is I'm more empathizing with the people who are contestants on the show more than I am viewing them as characters that are on the show. Because I've been there. I've been there. And I, and, and so whenever I have an instinct to say something I might have thought about, like a character before I was on it, I realized, oh, no, this is like a, a person. And I've been there. Like, like here's an example. Here's, here's an example of what, like, definitely changed my experience out there. Like, like, there's that meme when people say, oh, it's so nice to go in the tribal council knowing I'm not going home and the plan's going to go my way. And we all laugh. And I'm like, oh, my God. How could someone say something so stupid? Then they go home. Well, I said that. I said that the night I was going to go home. I can't believe they got it out of me. Those producers, they didn't use it. I think you know, they, for dramatic reasons, they told it differently. But I, after the after I did that confessional, I was like, did I just say that? And I realized, oh, my God, they got it out of me. And after I got voted out, like I said something to the effect of, like they asked me, so Christian, what does it feel like to really finally know what it's like? Uh, to, to, to feel like you have some power at this tribal council. I was like, oh, you know, it feels good to know have some power at this tribal. They got it out of me. So like, I can't judge people who say things like that on the show because I know that they're good at pulling it out. So, so I think what I watch now, I'm more, the, what I'm thinking about is like, okay, this person is watching this at home and I, I they need, it, it's hopefully they're having a wonderful time, but it also can be a lot. So I'm viewing it from that perspective. I mean, as, as, when I watch it now, as opposed to when I watched before. All right. Let me bring you one more question here yeah. from Aaron, who wants to ask you, how many holes does the straw have? Two oh. or just one? The answer is one. The answer is one hole. Okay. This is a classic one that, that 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 came up really big. I think in 2015, people started to ask question: How okay. many holes are in a straw? Okay, and the and this is uh, this could be a, a, a little little tour of a, a field called topology. Okay, it's, and and, it, and so the, the topology is the mathematics of basically shapes, but shapes that can be squished and stretched more or less. But that's basically the study of shapes. And the thing to think about that the reason that we think that a straw has one hole, okay, 
is that in the field of topology, you judge a shape and the number of holes uh, uh, irrespective of the of how much a shape is stretched. So in the field of topology, a donut is the same topology as a coffee mug. Technically, we call them homeomorphisms, but that's a lot of syllables. Well, so, yeah. that's beautiful and poetic. Yes. That the donut has as many holes as the coffee cup that I'm going to dunk the donut in? Yes, yes. I mean, that's exactly. And they are, they are called homeomorphisms. And what does that mean? That means that if I can take the, I can take one of those things, I can take the donut and I can mold it without poking any new holes or gluing any parts together. And I can make the coffee mug. I can sort of mm-hmm. mold that shape and then go back. Okay. So, so that you view them as kind of the same. So if you took that straw, okay, it's super long, you know, and so you might think of it having two holes, but then you shrunk it, okay, down to something that's really flat, all of a sudden you have a ring, okay? And people wouldn't say a ring has two holes for the most part. And mm-hmm. mathematically, there's actually, a, there's a way of calculating the number of holes. Uh, if, you, if you take the integral of it or stuff, there's some math there. But so uh, ma- mathematically, it means the, 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 by the definition of, topo- of, of topology, and uh, but th- th- that is, is homeomorphic with a ring. And a ring has one hole. Mm-hmm. Now you might say, but I don't care about topology. Why, why does topology call it that have that definition? Why is it so important that you have this this definition? And and the reason being, so like so, uh, just to use another example, like let's say you take something like flat, like a pancake. You could never turn this into a donut without poking a hole in the middle or stretching it out and then turn it and then gluing two parts together. Okay, so they would be diffeomorphic. So by those definitions, that's why we know that a straw is one hole. Now, why is that important? Well, topology has a lot of uses in science. It actually spans across a lot of different applications. Um, I'll give you one from survival, okay? Okay. At the beginning of season 45, there was this sweat savvy or sweat competition where you had this ball that needed to be taken out over all these hoops. Brando and um, and Jake and and Sabaya and Caleb all did this challenge at the beginning, and Emily had to do it later. And so the way and the, those are it's called a disentanglement puzzle, and they're actually quite they can be quite difficult. And there's no one algorithm for solving these things, but there are some tricks. And some of the tricks that you can do to help solve these is that if you envision these hoops and this um and 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 this rope, and if in your mind you can sort of shrink and stretch some of those hoops, and all of a sudden it becomes obvious how you would pull out the string, that actually gives you a hint as to how to move it, okay? Because they are the same topology, all right? And there are all kinds of ways that topology is used to understand the world. There, and this is, this I think, this is one of the more interesting mathematical theorems that I feel has come out. It's got an interesting name. Uh, it's called the Harry Ball Theorem. The, what is Harry it called? Ball, the Harry Ball theorem. Harry Ball theorem. 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 It's the theorem in mathematics. I did not make up that name. That is the actual theorem. Okay. Okay. And the, the what it states is, is so it, it, what it what it pertains to is the idea is that imagine you have a circle, okay, that has hair standing off off of it. Okay. All right. The question is the central question of the theorem is given this shape and having a bunch of hairs around the outside. Can you comb the hairs continuously so that way there is no cowlick in them? There's no part that you have to make. Can you comb it continuously? And if this is just a circle, and this is something that comes out of topology, by the way, the hairy ball theorem, the idea mm-hmm. you have hairs on a, some kind of ball. I don't know why Henri Poincaré named it that. I don't think he did, unless it was le ball hairy or something. Uh, but if you can, uh, so, so, Question is, can you comb the hairs continuously without a cowlick or a part? And on a circle, a flat circle, you can. Just imagine you take the hairs and you sort of comb them all around in a circle. And when you're done, they're all flat against each other, right? That's a sort of two-dimensional sort of circle, right? Now I'll take it to a sphere, all right? A sphere. You have hairs sticking out all over the sphere, okay? The hairy ball, if you will. Can you now comb it so now you have no cowlick there? You know, think, uh, and the answer is no. You cannot. It's impossible. There will always be a point where the hairs have to stick straight up, or uh, or or there will be some kind of part. There always will be a place. Okay. Now, what are the implications of that? 
other than just to make your podcast already audience a little uncomfortable about what they're playing in public. Okay. So the, the, if you analogize this ball to a sphere, something spheric, spherish, like the earth. All right. Yeah. Let's take the earth. Okay. Imagine you have the earth and let's say you place millions and millions of wind socks all over the earth and all these points around the earth, they're poking out of the earth. Like they were the hairs. Now they're wind socks that detect the wind. Right. So they, they will blow in the direction of the wind, right? Because the hairy ball of the hairy ball theorem saying that there is no way to comb all the hairs on the sphere such that there is no cowlick. That means that there will always be somewhere on the earth, one of those wind socks will not be blowing. That means there is always a point on the earth, no matter how many storms or tornadoes or crazy things happening, there's always a pro at least one place on the earth that the wind is not blowing. That's the implications of the hairy ball theorem that we know because of topology. And because of those definitions that we, by which we say there's only one hole in a straw, that's why we're able to make all those inferences such as the hairy ball theorem. And I'm done saying that name for the rest of the podcast. Wow. Is it because the wind needs to start somewhere? It's because, um, it's because wind, if you think about it, it has to like, it, you, the way we look at wind is a, what we call a vector field. Think about a bunch of arrows pointing like right here let's say in this room there's a little bit of air flowing around right here the air might be pointing in this direction like fl flowing in that direction but close next to it it's going to be pointing a slightly different direction um and so it's called a vector so, so basically it just it, it uh, you imagine a lot of little arrows pointing in the different directions that the wind is pointing right and what the harry ball harry ball theorem states is that HBT. This event, hbt the hbt states that um on a sphere there is there's no way to have a nice continuous vector field, okay? Meaning that there's going to have to be some place where the vector field is zero, meaning that there's going to be a point where it doesn't blow. It doesn't have to start anywhere necessarily. But it's, what it's more like is that if you were to comb two hairs and they were to come up up against each other and make mm -hmm. a cow lick, there's no way to yeah. avoid that cow lick is what it's like. Yeah. I really thought it was, you, you were saying Harry Ball and it was named after a guy, but it really is Harry Ball. It, at H A R I Y is actually the name. I will never forget when my freshman year calculus teacher told me that. Yeah. I was like, what? That is, the, that is actually a thing. Okay. All right. This segment is sponsored by Manscaped. <laughs> Learn topology with Manscaped. Are you familiar with the hairy ball theorem? Well, you won't be. After your not with our promo code. Topology. Check out the lawnmower 3.0. Solve the hairy ball theorem once and for all with Manscaped. I guess promo that, code Dr. Christian to save. <laughs> and like that. My job is rescinded. <laughs> yeah. You'll be as well, smooth as a humanoid robot in no time. Yeah, the, the jokes, I, I have to know who came up with this. I tried to search before the podcast. I was like, who came up with this? I don't think it was Henri Poincaré from France. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was him. Who popularizes this? The, the whole world of science is filled with weird stories like that. Uh, off no off podcast, I'll have, to, I'll have to tell you a different one that that would that would uh, rescind your monetization. Uh, that's that's there. <laughs> I'll tell you a different one. I was not involved in this one to be clear, but it, yes. yeah, yeah. Let's just say it had to, to do with the invention of Viagra. That's all. I'll leave it at. Okay. All right. What a tease for next time. That has to be. It wouldn't have to be like on. If a this Patreon podcast exclusive. goes longer than four hours, consult Doctor Christian. <laughs> what a way to end it. Um, yeah, I don't know if this is a treat for the people who stayed this long. It's I certainly so. a thing. I think so. Is it a treat. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it's. I think it would have to be a Patreon exclusive content or something, Rob, to tell that story on thing. But that's a. It's a publicly known story. It's. A, but there are all kinds of weird ones out in the, out in the science world. You know, people do all kinds of crazy uh experiments and stuff so okay all right christian anything else on your mind tonight oh i i think i got a lot off 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 of my chest i um i i just i have to say once once i realized that i was gonna have to talk about topology i couldn't resist having to talk about hbt mm -hmm. and uh but yeah it's but, but that's that's all i got for you rob i i will say it was 
it was fun being here. I, I, if people want to check out some of the other stuff I've talked about science, I, I did an appearance on uh, two appearances on the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, one of my favorite science podcasts. They're a uh, very popular one. Uh, I talk a little bit about Survivor on that, um, which is a good time. And I should be going back to Dragon Con again this year. I mean, we'll talk oh. before then. That's in, that's in September. But uh, I think it was a. I got to give a bunch of talks there, and they were a lot of fun, including one that was on the uh, we call it robot science or robot fiction. Okay. It was an entire it was an entire talk, uh, hour long talk about ro robots and movies and how realistic they are. And so I got to real I got to break down a lot of stuff. I, I it was well received. I even had a heckler, Rob. I had a heckler, heckler. at my time at my what they heckle. They were very upset about my takes about the uh, about IG eleven from Mandalorian that I that I had the minorest of quotes oh. about about IG eleven. It was the Star Wars fan that heckled. It you? was a Star Wars fan. I'm pretty sure it was a Star Wars fan. Maybe it was a, just a general purpose heckler that decided to like just harp on Star Wars. Yes, it's okay. I, I think I general think I agree this heckler more like. Yeah, yeah, I would say maybe I, it, like you know I think I'll handle the moment, but I never thought I'd have a heckler in any of my talks. Yeah, it was a good time. So cute. You were said that like, hey, IG eleven, uh, that that robot sucked, right? I didn't even say that. All oh. I said was like, oh, I actually went to great detail. I slowed down like the frame by frame of how IG eleven moved around and all the joints. I was like, hey, look, it's got you know, it has more degrees of freedom that I gave it credit for. It has shock absorber. You can tell it. Anyway, I went into detail all these praises. Like I said, the one thing I wish it did, I wish it had repositioned the blaster so it was in line with the axis of its motion. And the guy's like, well, you can't expect them to make a new blaster for every droid. I'm like, I'm like, I don't even know what to say to that, sir. I just like, <laughs> it, mm -hmm. was, it was, it was, it was, it, but it was, it was a fun experience. I, but you know, I, I, so, yeah, but you know, I say I haven't had a heckler. That's not true. I've had I've had college students, so I yeah. think that 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 can count to some degree. Okay, you watching anything interesting? You and Emily? Oh, oh well, we, we got to catch up on traders. Um, oh my god, what are we watching? We we watched the Squid Game, the challenge. We've watched okay. that show. Yeah, we finally did. I feel like the last three episodes could have been an email. Yep. yep but I. Yep. I, I I think that, but there there were there were hints of something interesting there. But like, um, I did get to do a deep dive. I was like, is there actual battleship, uh, uh, game theory out there? Because yes. there was a scene. Yeah. No spoilers, I guess. But there's a scene where someone claimed to have like a battleship strategy. Yeah, contestant eighteen. I think her name was B. Yeah, I, I really wanted to like B, and she had this very specific claim about battleship strategy. I'm like, where did this come from? And I looked it up. I could not find it anywhere. It didn't make sense. I think I feel like you think she was vibing. I she, she could have been vibing, but she seemed like a smart lady. I love to chat. Yeah. Look, look, contestant 18, please reach out. I am curious what you meant by that because I need answers. Ask Doctor B. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Christian, thank you for making the time to do this. Uh, always appreciated by me. I think that the listeners here were, uh, had a treat. And I think that the podcast uh, listeners are going to be uh, enjoying this one. So please, always uh, let Dr. Christian know that you enjoyed this. Uh, please. Uh, I think that uh, Christian appreciates the feedback on Twitter. He is still at Chubicki. Yep, and now I'm also on Threads now. I'm also on Threads. Oh, uh, the Threads is there. still going. Yeah, you know, I can tell. I, you're so active on Threads. I'm surprised you would you would be so. Uh, you know. I came in hot, but I got to be where the action is, Christian. Yeah, wh where is the action? Where is the action? Are they, you know, the blue sky? Is it still the no, still X? Is no, it Twitter? Or is it... I think it's still the X. I think that it's oh, like the X? Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, it's like it's, people I, hate I, I did... it there, but it's like, hey, it's our site. What are we gonna do? Yeah, and I guess that's it. I mean, I, I am trying to be a little more, at least as of this week, I try to do a little bit more Instagram stuff. I thought it might be fun mm -hmm. to branch out a bit and realize that, oh, you know, I can do some video stuff. I I, I would love to start, you know, talking more about science over video. I, Should I go I back actually, on threads? But I, I would not recommend it. I, I, you know I, what I've been on? So weird. LinkedIn. You, you, you're hiring Rob. Is that what this is? Uh, you just like, you no, I don't check my news feed on LinkedIn. Oh, okay. I thought she was like, hey, Sam, Sam, uh, Rob's looking for somebody else. I'm sorry to tell you he's mm -hmm. on LinkedIn right now. That's a... Well, you never know if you're going to have to find somebody there, but uh, the, yeah, yeah, I'd like to check my news feed on LinkedIn. 
that's not a bad idea because at least it's going to be reasonably professional, I would assume. Yeah, um, yeah. I feel like it's not like nobody's ever like, uh, you know, like we hate you. That's that's true. Everyone has to be because every, you're always talking to a potential new boss or employee. I feel mm-hmm. like on that side, site, so that would be not a it's bad very idea. Very chill on LinkedIn. That sounds good. Uh, it, Threads is too strange. My, I'm not sure why it got the impression I it's that I want the content that it's giving me, but I I'm almost fascinated that it thinks that about me. Is all I'll say. That mm-hmm. I have no idea what, what 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 what's going on in that thing's brain. Yeah. So uh, I, I like to check it out. Like to see if there's any professional tips there. Yeah, I, just, I, I, I think yeah, I think it's probably still Twitter at this point in terms of mm-hmm. where things are at. There's no professional tips on Twitter. There, it's 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 even hard to tell. I mean, it's the I think though what I love to do is I, I'll tell you, Rob. I, I have I have a YouTube channel, but I only have a couple yeah. things up on it. But I'll tell you secretly, I have probably a hundred lectures that are all unlisted. And I, I may have to build the courage to actually like put something out publicly with the, with with my robotics communication on that. Mm-hmm. One of these days, I'm gonna actually pull the trigger on that. Make YouTube my home. Are Are you ever still streaming on Twitch? I haven't done that in a bit. I've been, but I've been tempted because I really enjoyed it. Like giving some lectures. I was at a con conference once not long ago, and they pulled up my Twitch feed and they said, "Oh, I've watched your lecture on this." I'm like, that that would be a good thing for me to do. I mean, I also know people on Twitch. I know Puya. On Twitch, yep. you know, like you know, and and, and the, so you play the goose goose with, duck. I play the goose goose. I got a thing. I can just jump on there. I just you know jump on my whiteboard, my mm. iPad, and just start yammering at people and 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 ha- and have uh you know tens of people be interested. <laughs> do you whiteboard on the goose goose duck? Uh, no, I haven't. I did. I do algorithm on the goose goose duck a little bit. I tried mm. to make an algorithm for goose goose duck. It was very, uh, but it was just to determine who was talking, how much. And then I gave up uh, once yeah. I started uh, drinking some wine. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll let you get back to drinking some wine. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to tell people to check out? Uh, I think you find me as Chubicky on 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 many of the socials. Uh, and you know, and thank you very much uh, for for stopping by. I really appreciate all your attention. Okay. We've got a lot of stuff going on here on Robert's podcast this week. Uh, Big Traders Monday here. I had an exit interview with the latest person banished. I won't say who that is. Uh, And then we also had a feedback show with Michelle Fitzgerald, who uh, stopped by to talk about uh, some survivor people and challenge people that are on the traders. So uh, check that out as well. And then, of course, uh, we'll be back with the traders again live on Thursday night at 1015 p.m. Eastern time after the episode drops on Peacock. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Christian. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. Bye.